Recording in progress. Good evening. <laughs> echo, echo. This is welcome to the Board of Education meeting on March 14th in our action meeting. Um, we will start with um, calling the meeting to order and our Pledge of Allegiance. Please join us. Okay, Mrs. Sugars, if you could please take the roll call. Mrs. Stratton. Here. Mrs. Fleischer. Here. Mrs. Gallagher. Here. Mr. Greenbaum. Here. Mr. Mayor. Here. Dr. Rude. Here. Mrs. Tong. Here. Mrs. Winters. Here. Ms. Stern. Here. Okay. Thank you. And we are going to go to our first um, item of business, and that is our board recognition. We are very proud to recognize employees with many, many years of service. And I'm going to turn that over to Dr. Malash. Thank you, Ms. Stern. Um, so again, I agree with you. I'm incredibly excited. Always excited when we get an opportunity to honor the longevity of people that have dedicated such large portions of their lives uh, to the Cherry Hill School District, to the children, to the families, and to the community. So tonight, we are honoring 97 employees who hit milestones at the end of the last academic year. So these are folks that completed uh, a year at the end of 2022. Uh, for people that have served the district for 20 years, 25 years, 30 years, 35 years, and 45 years. Right, right? And Mrs. Wilson uh, gave me a note that she went through and totaled up the years of service that are being recognized tonight, and it's 2,230 years of service to Cherry Hill among these 97 folks, which is fantastic. Uh, there are folks from just about every job description in the district, uh, from our buildings and grounds folks to teachers, uh, to therapists, to administrators, secretaries, uh, all of the people that make Cherry Hill the wonderful place that it is uh, to work and to raise children and to send the children to school on a daily basis. So without further ado, because I know there are so many folks here, um, I'm going to ask Mrs. Wilson to join me up at the podium. Uh, we have certificates for everybody. We are going to announce everybody's name and ask you to come up to the podium to be recognized. We're going to do it in blocks, and we'll start with the people that are here for 20 years and then 25 years and, and go forward as such. Um, for each group, after the 20-year folks come up, we're going to ask you to go out into the lobby. Uh, and Ms. Mallory, um, everybody knows Ms. Mallory is our director of special ed. She's going to take group photos of all of you as well. All right? All right, Mrs. Wilson, let's go. Good evening. Um, well, good evening. I'm going to start with our 20 year recognition. These may not be particularly in alphabetical order um, it's with pronunciation.
Got it now? I don't know. We'll see. Oh, there we go. Okay. Uh, Maureen Carraza. Stephanie Corey. Tammy Danfield. Lisa D'Antonio. Shilpa Dave. Lisa Dorenzo. <laughs> Diane Fidele. Harry Floyd, Susan Gorman, Maria Grillo, Daria Hall, George Hanna, Bernadette Hickey. Nina Israel Zucker. Deborah Jacobs. <laughs> Yanel Joseph. Joanne Kavanaugh. Warren Kennedy, Andrea Marshall, Karen Maison, Cynthia O'Reilly, Joy Patterson. <laughs> Austin Pond, <clears throat> Nina Reinert, Maria, also known as Alejandra Rivas Mintz. Dale Schultz. Sheila Schedeker. Kenneth Smith. Donna Takis. Tina Walton, <laughs> Christine Williamson, Harry Wilwall. Sean Wollison, Rick Michiosha, Timothy Casale, Amy Edinger,
Michelle Komazuski. Jennifer Stever. Kimberly Redfern. Allison Dillon. Rachel Morgan. Karen Potter. <laughs> Robin Hausman. Lisa Feinstein. Amy Whitcraft, Evelyn Bichu, Christine Helms, Violetta Katsikis, Tara Orsini, Lynn Brady, Janine Fior Malone, Nicole Gilbert, Robin Schrupp, nope, that's 25 years. I think that's, there we go. Dan McMaster. Okay. Jennifer Woes Robbins, Opal Minio, Linda Weiss, Barbara Ross, Jennifer Taylor. Carolyn Roby and Elizabeth Riley Stern. That's it for our 20 year anniversaries. Congratulations, thank you. That was a big year, quite a class, right? <laughs> All right, now we have our 25 year employees, Robin Schwartz, Sherry Latanzio, Jacqueline Altman, Paul Arno. Rebecca Egbert. Rosemary Blumenstein. Kimberly Blissinger. Okay. 
That's what it says. <laughs> Teresa, I apologize for the pronunciation. Bassinate. Louis Barros. Dina Friedman. <laughs> Bill Kovnet. <laughs> Twenty five in a row. Twenty-five in a row. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that's what they said. <laughs> okay. Something in the eight, like thirty-four. So. Thank you. It doesn't make me believe you deserve a little extra. Well, thank you for a little extra. My wife. I'm taking a selfie if you don't mind. <laughs> we, we can wait. We can wait. Oh my God. I wait for you guys all the time. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> all right, here we go. Make it look good, Joe. You've you only got so much work. I know. You too, baby. Look at that. You look good. <laughs> I was good. Thanks, guys. Congratulations. Jennifer Henry. Julia Hampshire. Lori Lossie. Kathleen McKellett, I'm sorry I do this every time. Magalini, I do it every time. <laughs> Kathleen McMurtry Kohler. Ellie Miracola. Karen Morgan. Jacqueline Mulligan. Linda Peterson. Mary Powelson. Mary Radbill. Bill Segrist. Hey, uh, yes, the 25 year, if you go get your picture with Ms. Mallory. Congratulations, you're the best entree. <laughs> guys are great for coming out. Thanks for coming out. You guys are very good to come out. Congratulations. All right, now we have our 30 year anniversary recipients Christine Miller. Pamela Moore. <laughs> Nancy Paley. Oh. <laughs> Harry Sky. Allison Staffen. All right, we have one employee who's reached the 35 year milestone, Lisa Zimmerman. And our last two recipients at 45 years, Lee Troutman, 
and Lynn Kispolsky. Okay, well, that's really something um, really, really nice to recognize um, people who spent a lot of their 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 time with us and and contributing to uh, our kids, making the schools just as amazing places as they are. Okay, so we will now go to um, uh, Mr. Holt of uh, McNally. Uh, Mike Holt of Holt McNally Associates. I'll make sure I get it right. Uh, you're going to provide us a presentation on our audit. Yes, I am. Thank you so, so much thank for you having me here this evening. Welcome. Uh, I will give the uh, results of the June 30th, 2022 audit. Uh, it's a large document. I know that you guys got it's a couple hundred pages. I'm just going to hit upon the financial highlights. Uh, on pages 13 through 16, is the independent auditor's report. This is a report given by our accounting firm on the financial statements of Cherry Hill Board of Education as of that snapshot in time, June 30, 2022. Um, SAS 134 came out this year and there were changes to the layout and the content in that opinion. The one thing you'll really notice is the emphasis of the opinion paragraph right up front. So it cuts to the chase on the auditor's conclusion on the financial statements that are there. And I'm happy to report that the opinion is an unmodified opinion for June 30th, 2022. It's the best opinion that can be rendered. All of the assets, liabilities, fund balances, revenues, expenditures, and note disclosures are fairly stated in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles. So, and, and uh, requirements of the Department of Education, state of New Jersey. So again, a really, really great job there. Uh, let me hit upon it. The, Financial highlights for the district on page 37 and 38 is the governmental funds balance sheet and the income statement for the governmental funds. And there's some really good numbers here that are on this report as of June 30th. You'll notice there that the total cash was $26.5 million, unrestricted cash for the year. Receivables were about $3.9 million. We had restricted funds of $21.1 million, which was the capital reserve funds. We had liabilities of uh, about $4.1 million. So there's a really good working capital ratio there of what the assets versus the current liabilities are for the district. And then the fund balance numbers that are there, uh, the total fund balance numbers for the general fund, the operation fund is about $40.5 million. Of that $40.5 million, 21 is for future capital. It's in the capital reserve fund. Put that away. That's in addition to the... Uh, bonding money that went through that uh, is in the process of uh, uh, being spent. Uh, the excess surplus for the year. So the district's allowed to hold 4% of its operating expenditures. You guys are above and beyond that. Um, that number is $9.7 million that you have. Uh, the max that you can have, the district has. You also have excess, which is for tax relief in the 24 budget that's being worked on. And that's 1543000 so the numbers are really good. When you take a look at the resources and the expenditures of the district, uh, on the next page, page 38, you can see there that the total revenues were $270 million for the governmental funds. Of that, $183 million came from the tax levy resources. That's about 82%. The other portion uh, is about uh, $75 million, which includes on behalf numbers. It's about 13%. So only 13% of the revenue base comes from the state to fund, you know, a $270 million district. Um, yeah, not fair. Um, 
And then the federal portion is only three and a half percent, $7.7 million that you have there. Uh, in total expenditures, you had a total of 264,000. Of that, 96,000, uh, 96 million uh, were instructional expenses. Support services and undistributed expenses were $72.4 million. Total expenses were 264 million, gave an excess of $10.3 million for the year, um, which really was put back into the capital reserve funds. In addition to the regular audit that occurred, we also had a single audit. You've heard me talk about that before, where when a district expends in excess of $750,000, there's another level of audits that go on. There's a review that needs to be done. We come in and we take a look at the internal control and compliance requirements set by Title II uh, of the federal government. And we had quite a number of projects that we had to go in and take a look at, um, especially with the COVID and CARES and uh, monies that were there for the year. We had a state single audit where we had to go in and test the extraordinary aid, transportation aid, and TPAF Social Security. And then on the federal side, we had to hit the ESSER funds, the Education Stabilization Funds, the IDEA B, and the Local Fiscal Recovery Fund. So there were six projects, and I'm happy to report back to the board that all of the internal control components were in place and compliance requirements were met with the testing. There is an awful lot of testing that goes into these uh, reports, especially this day and age with the single audits. So I'm real happy to report to the board that there are no comments or recommendations. Um, the report has been filed. It's filed on time. I'm hoping next year that the GASB 75 information with the host employment benefits, that's why this report is held up. I'm hoping that that is on time or more timely anyway next year. This is five years in a row now that we've been going through this. So again, no comments or recommendation. I want to thank uh, Lynn um, for the courtesies that were extended to our staff. We probably have 650 hours it takes us to come in and do an audit here. It's a big district. And again, a really, really good job. Anybody have any comments or? Yes. So I have a couple of questions. So I read it all. <laughs> it took me a long time. Yeah. But I do have a couple of questions. So I was trying to figure this out. So in capital assets, um, when it comes to like the value of buildings, land, equipment, all that, um, I think it's on, it's on page 34 of the PDF, but 24 of the doc. Um, I'm just curious when we do all of our bond work, which is going to increase the, like our asset value, what is that like? So how is that going to, like I, our net, our net impact will be impacted. And I'm just curious, like, what's the impact of those changes um, when it comes to like yeah. our district? Yep. So if you have the audit report in front of you, you read it on page 61 okay. of the audit report is the note number five for the capital assets. Yes. And it gives a better description besides yeah. what's on page 34 okay. that you have there that makes up that $123 million in capital assets. And it's broken down between capital assets not being depreciated, which is land. Right. And then you have the capital assets that are being depreciated between the land, the buildings and the equipment. Right. So when the construction starts, mm -hmm. all of that's going to go into something called construction in progress. Okay. That's going to fall into where the capital assets not being depreciated. Okay. Once those projects are completed mm -hmm. and the asset is placed in the service, then we start to depreciate those assets over, over the useful life okay. on a straight line basis. And then we'll move that in, we'll, we'll move those assets, the buildings and building improvements, equipment, whatever's being purchased out of the construction and progress into those different buckets okay. that you see there for the land improvements, the buildings and the equipment. Okay. And then at that point, it'll be depreciated. So yes, your value on the capital assets is going to skyrocket right. as these go on. You're also though going to be picking up debt service, right? Right. So now we have this $300 million bond that we did. Yeah. So that's going to show up. So right now you don't have a fund 40 in your financials. Right. It goes back in 2017. We ended up paying down our debt service mm -hmm. completely. Right. Now that's coming in for the 23 or the current year. Okay. So we'll be picking up that. So that's kind of the offset. Okay. You've got the assets and then you've got the liabilities being the bonds. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, 
next question is um, in note two, what page was it? What? I forget. But um, it says the district does not have a policy for custodial credit risk. Um, and it shows that we're currently, we could be like with, with banks, like um, past FDIC, that the district could potentially be at risk of losing like $56 million in the event of like a catastrophe. I was consider, I was curious, consider, curious why this isn't considered a deficiency. And also, is this something that the board should consider implementing? So, the, so if you look just below that, you'll see that the FDIC and the GUTPA, right. there's $55.4 million that's covered through FDIC. Okay. And that the other portion that's there, the uninsured, uncollateralized money, they are monies that are sitting in different trust funds, okay. the payroll and that kind of stuff. It's just not covered okay. until yesterday. Okay. Right. You right, saw right, what right. happened yesterday. Everything's yes. covered now. So I think you're going to be okay. Well, until everything, <laughs> until the money's and that's out. That's no lie. That's no joke. I no, mean, I know. I've been paying so. attention, but until the money's yeah. run out, right? Like, yeah. potentially. Yeah. Okay. But I guess my question is, is like, do you see the value of potentially creating a custodial risk, like credit risk? As it said in the, doesn't it say that in the audit, um, that the district doesn't have a, a credit risk policy? Yeah, that's something that we can we can go over with with Lynn at some other point. But yes, okay. it is something we can revisit. Okay. Yeah. And then um, so I noticed that the district has a um the district and the township. So the township took out, no, the township sold $2.5 million worth of bonds um to cover half of the turf for east and west. And the district owes the 1.255 in return at an like as a loan, I was curious why that doesn't show under long-term debt. Uh, I think it does. So if you look at- It does? Yeah, if you look at note number, if you look at page 62, you'll see the shared service loan payable. Okay. The right, right there, that's 665,000. So it's part of okay. long-term debt. There's a portion of it that is current uh, within 12 months to 125,000. Okay. There's an amortization on page 63 of that. Right. Where you'll see the principal and interest. So it is it's, recorded. Okay. It's just lumped into one line. I see. Within the A1 exhibit that, that, that has the debt. Okay. Because I think at one point it says the district holds no long-term debt. That's why I was. Bond, I didn't know. bond, bonded debt. Okay. Bonded debt. As okay. of June 30th, 2022. I see. Okay. Yep. And then. My last question is in the exhibit K2 at the end, um, it has Cherry Hill as the header, but in the note, it states that the it's for Clearview Regional High School. <laughs> well, I apologize for that. I'll change that. <laughs> okay. I just didn't yeah. know which was which, if this uh, was ours or Clearview. No, no, no. It's, it's, it's yours. Okay. It's yours. Uh, I will go back in and change that and make sure you have that for the final. Okay. okay. Perfect. Thank you. Those were my questions. Thank okay. you. I appreciate it. Very good. Okay, great. Thanks. Do we have other questions from board members? Mrs. Fleischer. I don't have any questions. I just wanted to thank Mr. Holt with the amount of hours that you had to put in um, with everything and also thank Mrs. Sugars and her staff and Dr. Malash um, for uh, having such a complete report for us. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Great job too. Finance department, really. You have a great finance department for sure. Okay. Other questions? So, Mr. Holt, I'm a big round number, big picture person. How do we look? You guys are in sound financial shape. Okay. Yep. So we're Very good because you said that at the BNF meeting, and I just wanted to yep. be, make sure everyone got a chance to hear that you, that you yep. think that we're in very good shape. So that's good, good to hear. Very okay. Very good shape. Yep. All right. Okay. Great. Thank you. All right. Thank All you right. so Have much. A great night. You too. Oh, yeah, it's okay. Thank you. Okay, so now um, we move along to um, our goals update. So um, I think it's going to be Dr. Birdie, um, Ms. Giordano, and Mrs. Tiernan who are going to um, present us with an update on our goals. Thank you. Hi. 
Thank you. Thank you to the board for having us here this evening. Uh, we are going to provide an update on um, some of our building goals, district goals, and I will be representing our elementary schools this evening. The last time around, the elementary schools presented on student wellness. So uh, tonight's presentation will be related to our purpose and passion goal. Uh, at the elementary level, uh, obviously, we recognize that uh, there's a strong correlation between teacher effectiveness and student achievement. So when we're looking at the goals that we set in each of our buildings, we take a look first at professional development and the learning of the staff. This year, we have been able to dig into our new Marzano framework that we use for teacher evaluation. And within that framework, all of our schools are specifically focused on the elements of student engagement and identifying critical content from the standards. So staff have had training on these elements, have looked at what this looks like in a classroom. We also have utilized um, the amazing coaches that we have in the district, our math coaches, our literacy coaches, our technology coach, Ms. Esposito, our special education coaches. And these coaches have played an integral role in providing professional development to staff, in modeling strategies for our staff members, um, and then even going through coaching cycles with them, observing them teach, giving them feedback, looking at student data with them um, to decide uh, where the next targets should be. Um, we've also had an opportunity to train many of our educational assistants this year. Um, those who are providing either specified intervention programs for students. They've had training on those programs. Uh, we've also had training on trauma-informed teaching for educational assistants to give them some perspective um, in how they're connecting with our students. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So um, a huge piece of this is certainly looking at student achievement data, looking at other data that we're able to gather in the elementary schools. Uh, we do these data review meetings as whole groups. We do them during faculty meetings, lunch and learns, um, PLC time as a whole group, as well as PLC time for individual grade levels or um, instructional groups. So when we, when we have data review meetings at the elementary level, we're looking at data from NJSLA, uh, specifically in the beginning of the year to gauge um, the specific standards in which our students at a particular school were successful or standards that we want to address as a staff as a whole. We look at unit assessments, um, math modules related to Eureka Math. And then as we're looking at that data, we identify both content areas that we want to focus on. Maybe we're finding that a specific skill has just been challenging for a specific grade level. So then we look at that content piece and how do we deliver that in a different way. Um, and we also look for a specific targeted intervention. So students, either groups of students or individual students who need specific interventions to help them to be successful in um, the standards that they're that they're showing they're struggling with. So. Uh, that might be different in uh, different schools and different grade levels. We use the intervention and enrichment period in all the elementary schools to provide intervention directly from the classroom teacher, either meeting with small groups or individuals. We have um, differentiated lesson planning that'll take place based on these data review meetings, maybe just bringing in a different way of teaching, different ways of assessing the students. Um, some supplemental resources, we have technology resources that students can access either in school or out of school that support the instruction, things like Zern, where we can give students specific targeted lessons to review um, outside of the class time. And then, of course, we have um, the INRS process. The intervention and referral service team will collaborate, develop individualized goals for specific students. So these might be six or eight week goals targeted skills, students might receive push-in services from either a basic skills teacher, a Title I teacher, or from our literacy coaches at times for some of the buildings that don't have access to um, as many basic skills or interventionists, and then, or they may receive those pull-out services as well. Um, and those individual goals are, are reviewed at regular INRS meetings and updated as needed based on the student's needs. And then we look at outcomes. So, you know, during our data meetings, we're looking at um, many of us use NJSLA for our district-wide building goals. 
um, which means we can't we can't really measure specific progress toward that NJ, NJSLA assessment, specifically in math. We might look at the modules in Eureka Math. Um, there's an example on the board of just one class and, and the top bar is mid module assessment. And then the lower bar is the end of module assessment for the same um, Eureka math module. Um, what we're looking for when we look at the mid module, how many of the students, what percentage of students are partially proficient? What are the standards that were assessed in that module? And then what do we need to do differently in the classroom to bring the partially proficient numbers down and the um, proficient numbers higher? Um, so those are conversations that we have with classroom teachers regularly. It's kind of an ongoing process. And then um, for English language arts, many of our schools have goals related to Dibbles because it's a normed assessment of early literacy. Um, there are just a few examples on the board of our mid winter assessment. Um, at Payne, they're measuring grade one for the building goal, and that's the overall composite score for Dibbles. And there's an increase from 71% um, at or above benchmark to 83% of the students in grade one at or above benchmark. At Barton, um, they're also looking at the composite score, but looking at it from K to two and went from 44% overall at or above benchmark to 52% at the winter benchmark. And then these will be assessed again in May. Um, at Cooper, we're looking at grades K and one and specifically phonemic, segmenta uh, phonemic segmentation. So um, we've, we've noticed that this is an area that we need to target in our building. Um, from the fall scores to winter, we've seen a 7% increase in phoneme SAG with, relation, uh, with regard to the Dibbles assessment. And um, last but certainly not least is the progress that we're seeing in our special education programs. Uh, Data is analyzed a little bit differently when we're looking at our students in, in specialized programs. So the students are um, the goals for each specific student are measured with, in, with progress reporting through each marking period, as well as annual review meetings from the special education teachers with the IEP team. So as students are meeting their goals and uh, making progress with relation to their grade level content skills, we've seen um, that we've been able to actually transition students into less restrictive settings um, based on the goals that they have been meeting, maybe in the language and learning disabilities class, making significant gains in reading and math, and then moving into a general education class and receiving resource replacement support instead of having a full day self-contained classroom setting. So um, at Cooper alone, we've had 12 students this year who have transitioned from one program to another. Um, so we are really proud of that, but that's happening across the district in the elementary special education programs. We're always looking to um, identify the spe specific needs of the student, and when they're able to um, make some gains in the content area, we know that they're ready to successfully transition into other um, classrooms. So um, that's a point of pride. And um, perhaps the most magnificent piece is um, this community building within um, our inclusive programs. So in Cooper School particular, we have an autism program, we have language learning disabilities classrooms, we have co-teaching, and we have resource. Um, so we, we have a tremendous opportunity for flexibility um, in terms of inclusive opportunities for students. And we have um, across the schools that offer these programs, there are reverse inclusion programs. So we have students coming in, working with the students in the classrooms, whether it be recess, um, during assemblies, during special events. We have partnership classes that come together, work with students, and this provides them um, just an opportunity to socialize with students of all grade levels and all ability levels. Um, so it has been a remarkable um, kind of organically born thing at Cooper. We had planned on doing reverse inclusion, but we really didn't need to have a structured plan because students ju uh, just wanted to go and help out. So we have fourth graders who just said, you know, we want to go help out. Can we have recess with them? Um, you know, and, and it's just kind of organically grown from there. So um, that happens at Horace Mann School. That happens at Woodcrest School. Um, the schools that are offering these specialized programs are really um, aware and looking at opportunities to 
present um, ourselves in a more inclusive way. And even school events, our PTAs are open to how do we make this event inclusive for all students? So um, we've seen terrific gains there. Of course, the outcomes are not always what we want them to be. Um, not every student is making progress at, at the level that we hope. And so that kind of takes us back and we circle back to that PD piece. So when we're looking at the data, if we're not seeing what we need to see for particular students or a group of students, we circle back to what can we learn as the educators? What can we do differently? And then implement that and start again with our data analysis piece. So we kind of go in cycles with that. Thank you for your time. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Birdie for an update from Carusi. Mrs. Tiernan, always a tough act to follow. Uh, my name is Neil Birdie, uh, and I'm honored and privileged to be the principal at Carusi Middle School. Uh, and I'm here tonight uh, discussing, unlike Mrs. Tiernan, who spoke on behalf of several uh, of her elementary colleagues, I am uh, specifically focused uh, on some of the great work that's going on at Carusi. Uh, we are fortunate at the middle level where all three principals will have the opportunity to come to the board. Uh, and again, in, in the five minutes that I've been allotted, it would be really difficult to discuss all of the amazing things uh, that we're super proud of. Uh, so my goal when putting this together was really to talk about uh, what's current, what's going on right now, and and could I speak to both process, uh, process and product. Uh, in terms of process, uh, we take goal development uh, extremely seriously. Uh, we start with the Board of Ed goals. Uh, we believe deeply in continuity and consistency uh, and articulation. Uh, so we, we begin our work uh, really after you finish your work. Uh, we look at the Board of Ed goals and we look at how do we, uh, how do we work those into, um, uh, you know, with a, with a focus on students at the building level, how are we planning our administrative goals? How are we planning our school-based goals? And how are teachers planning their SGOs and their individual goals, all with the Board of Ed goals in mind? Because we believe uh, deeply uh, in the in the systems-based approach to goal planning. Uh, so so along those lines, in terms of product, uh, I'm going to speak about uh, some things I'm, I'm proud of that are going on currently. Uh, first, in regard to student wellness, uh, we recognize uh, that as learners come to our school each and every day, uh, they are a different uh, learner than they were uh, just two or three years ago. So we have a, a laser focus on student wellness in terms of holistic, uh, holistically looking at students uh, and their their social and emotional wellness as long as uh, their their academic wellness. Uh, so so one of the things, in addition to the uh, hundreds of of student athletes we have at Carusi, uh, and and in addition to many of the high interest clubs we have, uh, newspaper, cooking, art, uh, etc. Uh, we've looked over the past two years to really start spa uh, safe space clubs. Uh, we believe uh, that all children should have a place that they feel comfortable and safe, and welcome and cared for. Uh, and we also allow any club to exist as long as there's student interest and an adult. Uh, who will supervise the club. Uh, so to that end, we're proud uh, of our Hispanic Heritage Club, uh, our Pride Club, our African American Culture Club, uh, which really just started this year. Uh, and, and most recently, our WE Society, which is, uh, that stands for Women Empowered, uh, who just held their first event at the Croc Center in Camden, which was amazing. They did a Women's History Month kickoff uh, last weekend. So again, uh, creating safe spaces for all kids where where they know they um, uh, they fit, they belong, and they feel welcomed. Uh, in addition, we have our transitional coach back this year. Uh, some of you are familiar with that. It's a grant funded position. Uh, where children at Carusi, uh, also at Barton and West, it's a it's a shared position. Uh, receive therapeutic um, uh, counseling uh, in the form of individual, group, and family therapy. Uh, through the regular uh, school day. So um, that's a that's a shared service, but again, one that really talks about and 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 serves the holistic child uh, in, in ways that school-based counseling uh, cannot and should not. In terms of purpose and passion, uh, several years ago, uh, we became a school-wide Title I school, uh, like our friends at High School West, and that allows us to provide Title I intervention to all students, regardless uh, of financial status. Uh, so we are we are continuing with our Title I ELA and math interventions. Uh, those are in the form of uh, push in and pull out. Uh, they occur all day, every day. Uh, and in addition, we've taken advantage of some of the scheduling efficiencies with the new middle school schedule around the extended block period and also advisory to provide even more targeted intervention uh, with our Title I folks. 
Uh, in addition to that, we've also started a, uh, a, a formal mentoring program that exists. Uh, one of our English language arts interventionists uh, also does um, some work with uh, students during advisory and during lunch, where she's focused on soft skills, interpersonal skills, time management. She's looking at uh, locker cleanouts, uh, homework planners, uh, things that are what I would consider value add, but certainly necessary for many of our children to be successful. Uh, we've also started uh, this year an NJHS tutoring program where we're using eighth grade honor society students to tutor in some of our sixth grade classrooms. Uh, so we believe deeply in peer leadership and in student uh, uh, agency. So for the first time, we're using our eighth grade students to tutor in some of our sixth grade classes. Uh, and then the last uh, bullet on there under purpose and passion uh, is ALLS, which stands for After School Learning Labs. Uh, these are alive and well. Uh, although they ran last year, they were uh, they were uh, scarcely attended. Uh, this year, we have many more students participating in both in-person after-school learning labs and also virtual evening learning labs, uh, which are which are held remotely uh, after school for those children that either play sports or take care of uh, younger siblings or uh, or just can't uh, can't commit to the after-school three to four thirty uh, ninety minute session. And then finally, connecting beyond our classrooms, we focus deeply on the articulation between our sending and receiving schools. Uh, we think it's important. Again, we are um, we are uh, not a system of schools, but really a school system. So we want to make sure that we're uh, working closely with those schools that send to us uh, and also those schools that we send to. Uh, so this week, all of our student governors have been visiting our four sending schools. Uh, so they visited Kilmer, Kingston, Payne, and Barton. Uh, and they did presentations to fifth grade classes talking about what it means to be a Mustang and what next year will look like and what our core values are and what it means to follow our care framework, uh, just to start to demystify and in some way uh, make that transition a little bit smoother and a little bit more friendly for some of our fifth graders. Um, we have, again, we've also focused on academic achievement. Uh, we are we are a school. We recognize that uh, outcomes uh, and, and academic success are at the core of what we do. Uh, so we focus deeply on pedagogy. We have fifth grade teachers visiting our sixth grade classrooms this week. Um, so that way they can start to look at what sixth grade instruction looks like. Um, we, we've started with math. We, we are keenly aware of the board goals around math. Uh, so we're, we have fifth grade teachers visiting sixth grade classrooms and looking at math instruction. Uh, we've also done uh, a tremendous amount of work around pedagogy, uh, instruction, and standards alignment based on the new uh, changes at the middle level. Uh, and then the last thing, and this is really brand new, it just happened on Friday. Uh, our African American Culture Club, it just made the presentation, Mrs. Stern. Uh, our African American Culture Club, uh, for the first time, got to visit with the African American Culture Club at West. So we held it via Zoom. Um, and they were able to interact with the officers of the West Club uh, as we are a newly formed club and they have lots of questions about what it looks like. And, and West has done it well for years and, and our students want to know, what does an agenda look like? Do you meet during school or after? Um, you know, but it's amazing uh, watching the West kids give guidance and, and advice to our Mustangs because the West kids are primarily former Mustangs, which is a cool sort of circle of life moment for me. Uh, I'll go quickly through the next slide because really it just talks about how we um, identify intervention. Uh, the intervention we run is all data driven. So we are looking at um, NJSLA, district benchmarks, start strong assessments, report card grades, attendance reports, uh, uh, discipline data. We're looking at all of those things that sort of triangulate data for us so we know where to dig in. Uh, and then we use a tiered system of intervention uh, really, at the forefront of that is our INRS program, uh, but I think, as I mentioned earlier, we are we are uh, using that as sort of the the central mechanism. But we're using advisory, we're using the new extended block period, we're using Title One, and we're using after school learning labs, um, and we're focused on pedagogy. We believe deeply that the the secret to uh, strong achievement is really good instruction. There 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 is no substitute for good instruction. So we're using all of our uh, discretionary time within the school, our PLCs, our faculty meetings, um, our department time to focus on evidence-based practices around teaching and learning, uh, and then finally measurement. Uh, we want to make sure we're evaluating uh, as we plan, as we act. We want to make sure that we're evaluating and we know what the outcomes are. Uh, so again, we're using things like lesson plans, classroom observations, uh, walkthroughs with our CNI friends, 
um, teacher SGOs, uh, annual performance reviews, and then some of the data management systems like Performance Matters uh, and Eureka to, to really determine what was our goal, what was our intervention, and were we successful? And I'm going to turn it over to Mrs. Giordano. I had a feeling this is going to happen. <laughs> I was like, at least I can see over it, right? Hi, everyone. I'm Lauren Giordano. I am the principal of the Alternative High School Program. Um, thank you for the opportunity to come and talk a little bit about all the cool stuff my staff is doing. I mean, I can't even say enough about them in five minutes, like I'm also limited to. Um, but, you know, just the opportunities that they create for the children in our program and their commitment to their personal individual success is something beyond inspiring on a daily basis. So I'll try to encapsulate a little bit of what they do um, for you guys. So, um, you know, really, I just love the idea that we're an opportunity for personal growth because on our campus, we really try to create an experience that is relevant to each student and we're able to do so because we are small and because our staff is so dedicated. So just to share briefly of some of our best practices over the last few years that we find are really staples in our program. Um, we focus on agreements over expectations. So we always start off our school year um, with student roundtables with teachers where we pick what you know it feels like, look, looks like, and sounds like to be in that classroom and how that classroom is ours and shared, which is posted on the wall. So, and from there, everything on our campus just kind of runs on agreements based in, you know, how do we want to be treated and how do we treat each other and how do we learn best, things like that and respect. Um, notation of student identified positives. Um, I mean, we celebrate children all day long. Um, it's all over if you were to walk our hallways. Um, we connect with families through an app. We're constantly looking to lift them up and recognize the good. Um, and the students also have voice in that. They vote in the beginning of the year for the three things they wanna be noted on. And we track it all year long, every single class, they're given the opportunity to be highlighted. Um, our schedule, we redid it um, this past year to cut out longer blocks. And we also made available staff every period of the day. So students would always have access to preferred staff and safe spaces should they be having a rough day. Um, and, and we also make it a point to meet with every single student so they can identify preferred staff. And we make a plan of how to support them with that preferred staff, which is shared out and updated consistently throughout the year. Um, we listen and share information. Something unique about our staff is that we meet every single day for 15 minutes at the end of the day and we talk about kids. And you know we share information that helps us provide a better experience for each each one. Um, and I guess our second piece is relationships. You know, how do we create safe spaces and trust? That's sort of at the forefront of everything that we do. Um, we incorporate the kids into everything. Um, you know, we meet with them every single quarter. We go over their grades. They give survey and feedback. Um, they choose our project-based learning and science. They choose where we go, what we do, and what they want to see. And we constantly do that because we constantly want to be relevant to the kids that are sitting in front of us and make it meaningful to them. So it, it just happens on a daily basis. Um, essential languaging, uh, the staff is very highly trained in how to approach children so that they feel seen and heard. Um, and that goes on. And in essence, you see children using that language with each other, which is one of the best things that you could ever see when you see someone turn around and you know, communicate in a way that really does show respect, even if there is a little bit of dissent. Um, connecting with parents, again, every parent is on the app that we use and gets notifications throughout the day. We send weekly parent letters, we uh, write a newspaper, we send home clips and photos of all the things that we do. Um, we email parents to recognize students weekly. Um, yeah, there's so, so much we invite parents in for our academic honor roll celebrations each marking period and really just try to communicate as much as we need to based on the position that the, their child is in. Um, high levels of care and compassion. The staff is extremely empathetic coupled with, you know, 
wraparound services and, uh, you know, just the way that we operate out of care, compassion, knowing what each child has been through and knowing what they need to be successful. Um, reset plans, that's something kind of mentioned above, after every student comes in, we meet with them, we do a reset plan where they have the opportunity to identify preferred staffs for potential triggers, needs, how do they calm down, what are they interested in learning to calm or cope with anxiety and where, what are their goals? Where do they wanna go? And how can we build a plan to get them to wherever they wanna be, whether it's back in a comprehensive setting, staying with us, going to college, going to technical school, um, building any type of scale. Uh, monthly connections, every, every student is chosen every month are in totality by our staff. And we have different initiatives that we run every month. For example, uh, this month, each staff member will write a personalized note um, to the students talking about an anecdote of where they were in the beginning and how far they've come. We will mail them the day before spring break so the students receive them over spring break, just as an example of what will be coming for this month. Just again, to get that piece of connection and know that we care so they're seen and heard. Um, student recognition, instead of having one student of the month, we split it into multiple categories based on what the students wanted to be recognized for. Um, so every month we're celebrating five or six children for different areas of growth across the campus. Student interest-based outings, um, you know, we noticed that our attendance was lower in January and February. So we asked the kids, how could we get them in? So we planned a variety of activities. We just finished a set of bowling and we had almost 100% participation every Thursday through the month of January and February. So 100% in school and 100% participating and going. We just moved into yoga out in the community in a local studio. We'll move on to a campground where we'll take the kids hiking and also we'll be meeting with a motivational speaker who specializes in push pull to relieve anxiety with weights and other things. So, and these were all ideas generated by kids and things they wanted to do together and experience as a community. Um, and then I guess the last one, investment in growth over discipline. So um, we do a lot of restorative practice. We make plans with students. Um, an example would be if a student did have an infraction, um, we might pick three staff members for the day, preferred staff, myself, guidance, therapist, and send them through sessions that are very targeted to help them understand their impact, help them grow, and help them rectify the situation. And they move through that in lieu of a suspension or something of that nature. And we do a lot of work like that um, because we want them in and we want the time to be able to work with them and help them grow. Um, our target skills for our program are self-advocacy, uh, safety, uh, willingness to compromise for the good of the order, pride in the, our accomplishments and activities, support, movement, and meeting realistic relevant goals and a positive mindset. A lot of the restorative practice has a component where we take a look at all the things that we bind to us and the image that we have for ourselves, and our staff is able to revamp that with more positive attributes and help kids see the best in them because that's what we see. Um, and our outcomes, I would say, again, our, our attendance has greatly improved over time. Academics, first quarter, we had 72% of our population make AB honor roll. 100% of the LGBTQ population was within that 72%. Um, this marking period, we're around 61%. So, uh, but we also picked up about 10 students over the last month. So, um, you know, just again, that's something that speaks volumes, but even an anecdote from today, watching a child try their absolute best on the NJSLA in a math room they wouldn't walk into last year because they would be in tears for us as a win, right? Um, so just the idea that the goals are relevant, realistic, and we're celebrating it every chance we get. And then connect four plans for seniors. Um, that's something new we adopted this year where we meet with every senior family three times a year so that we can figure out what the goals are, what is the plan, how do we connect them to that plan, and how do we connect their families then to the next level institution, whatever it's going to be, or the next level plan employment. And we track it all year. Um, and then participation in SLA and CBI, which is structured learning experience and community-based instruction, has tremendous momentum across our campus. We've opened a cafe. We've done a dog treat business. We make breakfast to order. Kids go around, take orders, have a whole system. 
um, they're planning projects with the money, such as building aquariums and, you know, chicken coops. Yes. So, and many, many more. That's the one that, you know, but again, you know, they have so much power over what happens and in turn are empowered. So thank you for your time. So on, I, I can attest to the fact that dogs do like the dog treats because my dog has enjoyed the dog treats that I purchased on Friday. So, um, okay. So um, questions from board members or comments, uh, Mr. Mayor. First of all, um, thank you, um, all of you, and I'll, it'll be real. I'll be really brief. I just want to um, <clears throat> a couple of the points that you made, and these are things I'm I'm familiar with for the most part because I've I've it's important to me and I've worked with many of you in the past. Um, but uh, one of my, one of my kids actually asked me a couple of days ago, they were going through the goals, um, trying to understand more about what we did, uh, more about what I did and why I'm not home as much as sometimes they would like me to be to help them with their homework. Sometimes they asked about pur purpose and passion or one of them did like, really, what is that? And I tried to explain it to them and I probably did a horrible job, but, uh, Mrs. Tiernan, in your in your presentation, you hit the nail on the head much better than I could have for my kids, and and I think um, showing the the value and relevance of pur of purpose and passion when mentioning the reverse inclusion program, and that to me that's what purpose and passion is. It is teaching or providing opportunities for students to learn how to be comfortable being inclusive, being understanding, being compassionate, being helpful um, to others, um, to others who maybe don't uh, have different challenges than they do, maybe look differently than they do. And those are skills um, that are important for success beyond school, regardless of what, um, regardless of, of what walk in life professionally they may, they may go, go for. You know, a lot of a lot of our students aren't going to do anything with math when they leave. Um, but everyone needs to learn how to understand one another and be more compassionate. Um, so I think th that really speaks to me what the relevance of purpose and passion is. And and I just want to uh, also thank all of you with because it sounds like a lot of what is happening at the schools isn't just finding a program and running with it. It's constantly evaluating that program to determine which ones work best, which ones can work better, the ones that are working well can work better, which ones maybe aren't working out well, and also doing it on a person level by student. Like what works for this student? How can we lift that student up? Um, it's, it's all outstanding. So I, I love hearing that. One question I have though about, and I'll go back to the reverse inclusion. Um, how many of the elementary schools are now um, participating in that particular program? Um, so I, I know that uh, the, the schools that have the autism support programs do some sort of reverse inclusion. So it's not really a program as much as it is just an opportunity to bring students in. It's not, there's no um, specified activity. It's really based on what the students are learning at that time, bringing in maybe older students or um, just like slightly older than the students who were in the classroom so that they can help them with either art skills, um, literacy or math skills, um, or just socially, uh, you know, opportunities for them to socialize together. Right. I and mean, it's a wonderful opportunity. And, and hopefully it's something that that all the schools can find a way to, you know, to 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 provide to all the students because it, you know, at the end of the day, that's what we help. We, you know, all these kids need to be uh, have those skills and and understanding. And um, so it's great to hear that that's working as well as it is. Thank you. Yep. Other board member questions or comments? Uh, Mrs. Winters and then Mrs. Fisher. Thanks. I actually have a few questions about middle school, which is one of my favorite places to be and think about. <laughs> um, my first question is about, you mentioned the um, the use of the extension block and advisory 
in middle level for um, ELA and math interventions. And I've been thinking a lot about the new middle level schedule as it's been implemented this year. Do you really feel that extension period is important for those targeted interventions? And who, can you give a few examples of what you're doing? So, so I do, um, but I do think it's still a work in progress. So, so I, I'm, I'm a cautious yes to that. Uh, because we've also been working um, as we've gone through, uh, we started actually at the end of last year, really looking at um, what types of pedagogy work best in in the extended block, right? Because uh, for the majority of our staff, they've never they've never done it before. Uh, so some specific examples, we've done a lot more small group uh, and a lot more uh, what I would consider almost like uh, evidence based elementary pedagogy, where we're really looking at. Uh, very specific skills, teachers working in small groups at tables with uh, a number of, uh, you know, smaller number of kids, uh, while the other folks are working on maybe extension or uh, enrichment activities. And there's some type of uh, very specific mini lesson targeted goal, uh, maybe in math, uh, we've been looking a lot at multi step equations, um, students, we find that their fluency, their math fluency is uh, relatively strong. Uh, but a lot of kids get lost a little bit in the sauce when you ask them to do multiple uh, steps in order to solve an equation. Um, in ELA, we've been doing a lot of work around informational literacy uh, and, and nonfiction text. So, so that that's happening uh, a tremendous amount in our uh, in our extended block. Uh, we've also again used our professional development time to bring that outside of uh, just our ELA classes. We're we're now doing that in science. We're doing that in social studies. So we're really working uh, on informational text across disciplines um, in advisory. The, the beauty of the new schedule at Carusi is for the first time in probably 20 years, our special ed teachers are assigned to a house. So they're all on team. Uh, so for the for the first time uh, in, in recent history, they're part of the advisory program. They all have homerooms. They're all assigned to those classes and they're able to provide additional intervention because there are more, uh, there are more staff assigned uh, so they can do pull out, they can shuffle kids, um, they can they can hold small groups. Tuesday and Thursday might be math intervention, Monday and Wednesday might be uh, ELA intervention, uh, but it just gives us such a new level of flexibility. Uh, and it's all due to the middle school schedule, because that's really how we've captured the efficiencies of being able to put our special educators back on team. That's really good to hear. Thank you. Um, my second question is about the after school learning labs. I'm not familiar with them. Can you just speak a little bit about what those are and sure. how they're used? Of course. So we, we, we jettisoned the notion of homework club. And I think Mr. Mayor's point was really spot on. We, we are looking at what works and what doesn't. Um, and we want to make sure we're moving away from things that don't work. Uh, homework club was not working. Uh, homework club was more of an after school study hall uh, where kids could show up uh, with or without work um, and, and, and sort of hang out and, uh, and, and, and get caught up or, or, or not in some cases uh, socialize. Uh, so what we, we moved to is a more uh, targeted intervention after school. Uh, we put the bones of it together last year and we've continued it this year uh, where students need to sign up. Uh, it, they're, they're driven by content. So again, Monday might be math, Tuesday might be world language, Wednesday might be science. And uh, we ask students to sign up in the mornings uh, through their guidance counselor. So they know, and we know, uh, that they are there for very specific instruction in a content area, um, and that's been that's been well attended. We 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 started slow. Uh, uh, we've we've gotten a lot more staff that are interested in staying after and working in the program. Uh, we've also had our counselors. Uh, you know, after we after we look at um, you know when report cards uh, are published, then we look at grades. Uh, we you know we we had a, sort of an invitational uh, session where we invited kids to come in. Uh, and then for those that were still reluctant, we we started to involve families and and just let them know, you know, hey, this is another service that we offer after school, um, you know, based on a few factors, it might be it might be important to start to allow your child to attend these these sessions. And those are teacher led sessions. All teacher led, all by certified content area folks. So we have our math that's teachers incredible. running the math intervention, our science our science teachers, etc. Oh, that's really neat. I mean, one thing, and everybody knows I keep talking about this, I'm interested in as we move towards the three districted middle schools is thinking about what works really well at each middle school. And if it's working really well, how can we replicate that at the other middle school? So I'm sort of trying to like take pieces as I hear from you guys about what's working really well and think about how we can um, use that throughout the district. And my last kind of question is, you talked about the articulation between fifth and sixth grade and transitions between levels is something I think about a lot. Um, so I'm really excited a lot. I think it's something that, you know, we could definitely improve on um, just as a whole. I mean, it's a tough thing to do. There's a huge difference between 
I have a fifth grader right now. There's a huge difference between fifth and sixth, right? Between preschool and kindergarten, between eighth and ninth. So um, when the fifth grade teachers came and visited the sixth grade classrooms for math instruction, like, can you describe a little bit about how that went and, you know, what lessons you think that they were able to take back to their fifth graders as a, their fifth graders are preparing to move up next year? Because I know it looks very different between fifth and sixth. So those visits will happen this week. Uh, I believe they're set up for the end of this week or the beginning of next, uh, the date that I'm, I'm not totally sure of the date. Uh, so those visits haven't happened yet. Uh, where we started with articulation um, was with ICR classes. So we started to have uh, manager uh, case manager meetings between our fifth and sixth grade folks and also included um, ICR teachers to take a look at what's the difference between inclusion in fifth grade and inclusion at the middle level. So th those conversations have already started. Uh, in terms of the math meetings, uh, the the goal I think is really straightforward. I think we we don't do enough work around bringing our folks together, uh, especially those folks that hand us off kids every year. Uh, so getting an idea of where a sixth grader is in September, in January, in June, probably will. Uh, my my hope is that my suspicion is that it will help those fifth grade teachers to really think about what a fifth grader looks like when they enter their class and where they need to be when they exit uh, on their way to sixth grade. That's awesome. So this is a pretty new process. Is this the first time you're doing it? This is an exclusive. This is amazing. Yeah. I'm so excited. <laughs> and I absolutely do. And it's the last thing. I really love the idea that your um your Karusi kids are going to the elementary schools that we'll be sending to you because I think forging those connections is really important. And a lot of times I think students hear and learn and listen and understand better from other students. Agreed. Especially older students. So that's a really neat connection you're making. So thank you, thank you so much. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Okay, Mrs. Fleischer. Thank you. I think it's perfect order because we heard from Mrs. Tiernan and Dr. Birdie, and now I wanted to say something about Mrs. Giordano. Um, <laughs> so it's perfect. But um, I think, I, I hope, um, I'm speaking for myself, but I think uh, all of us feel the same way. I just want to thank you so much for doing the reporting out from your kids and how they do the reporting um, for our meetings. It's really been insightful to, for us to get sort of a glimpse into their day and also to see the confidence that they exude and the different types of students and that you have actually reporting. It's been really wonderful. So I just wanted to take this time to, to thank you because I haven't seen you in person since you really started doing everything. So we're lucky we have Aiden, we have Liz for East and West. So we really feel great that we have the alternative high school now. So thank you very much. They really do enjoy doing it. They love going around interviewing other people. They write the script themselves and then they put the slides together and then we, you know, one student volunteers to do the book for. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Sorry, you had to you had to go after Dr. Birdie. <laughs> anyway, sorry. Um, thank you so much for saying that. The kids really do enjoy doing it and they they actually rotate and all kind of participate. So different kids want to interview about different things that go on. They put the slides together. Most of the pictures are taken by them. Um, and even the Lewis Ledger, you know, that's kind of all them under the guidance of what they want to do. So it is really, really nice to, you know, have them have the opportunity and thank you for being interested. Of course. And tell them we can't wait for the next, uh, set. <laughs> okay. Other board member questions or comments? Um, this is Ms. Alma Stratton. Thank you. Um, I just had two questions just because I don't know what they mean and I'm trying to get back to my notes. <sighs> Pulled out. I think it was in uh, middle school. What is I and RS stand for? So INRS is a, an acronym for intervention and referral services. And I think Mrs. Tiernan also um, spoke to INRS as well. It's really a team-based approach to making sure all learners have all of the supports that schools offer. Uh, so, for instance, a student might be referred to INRS uh, for an academic difficulty. It could potentially be uh, an emotional difficulty or behavioral difficulty, uh, but it's really a team-based approach to making sure that um, students have specific individualized goals. Uh, these are not IEP'd or classified students. These are, these are general ed students uh, who have uh, very specific goals, uh, very clear interventions in place. Uh, these include support uh, mechanisms, typically through the adults in the building, maybe a teacher or a counselor, uh, or even just a, a, an adult mentor, maybe for a check-in or a check-out. Um, but it's really a team-based approach to uh, serving all children. Okay, thank you so much. And I again wanted to echo what uh, Ms. Fleischer said. It was nice to hear from the Alternative High School. Um, I have 
been back there for for a few things so I, I really enjoy that the videos and um I firsthand account with Mrs. Tiernan that Cooper is doing a, a fantastic job over there the other note I had because it's something that um our curriculum chair had had been wanting us to take a look at is the focus on the kindergartners that um have gone through the full day so you you have a specific focus on the K through one. Is that something that's shared across this elementary school so that we could see if that's made progress with the full day? Yeah, so the, the goal that we set specific to our K and one um, students is is due to data that we looked at, at in the beginning of the year on the Dibbles indicator. So um, it's not uncommon for schools to start with the K one and two, um, specifically with Dibbles, because it's a normed assessment, it gives us a good idea of which students um, are likely to have difficulty as they become emergent readers. Um, in terms of the full day program, we have done district wide surveys on the full day program, um, but our specific goals that we set this year were based on just what we're seeing as the students enter. Um, so not necessarily looking back to 2019 when we began the full day program till now, but rather the students that are in front of us this year, what are their needs and uh, how do we help them get the skills that they need to be prepared for first grade or second grade. Mm -hmm. Other board members have questions or comments? Yeah, I'm, I actually have a few, so hang on there, Aiden. <laughs> um, so I, first and foremost, I want to thank you. Um, I've sat through several of these, pres uh, you know, updated district goal presentations over the years. Um, this was fantastic. Um, I mean, I think also because it's, you know, there's just a level of um, kind of everyone working together. That's very, for me personally, is very exciting. Um, it's part of why it makes sense to spend time doing what we do. Um, so, you know, really good. I just felt like really great highlights. Um, so I have several questions and some thoughts. Um, the um, the first, uh, I guess, kind of uh, comment is um, on reverse inclusion. Um, so it's interesting because uh, my own child with special needs had reverse inclusion, not in elementary, but in high school. Um, and it was unbelievably invaluable and um, and and now my other kids who are coming up, I think who are neurotypical, will likely be involved coming in as well. So it's really kind of full circle for me. Um, it's it's unbelievably invaluable. I'm thrilled to hear it's happening. And I think um, I'm hoping it's something that if continues to be successful, I'd love to see it implemented at all levels across all schools because it just does seem. Um, like you're having a lot of success with it. And I, I've definitely seen that firsthand. Um, so um, I think the other piece, you know, you touched on um, the um, uh, transitioning 12 students to a less restrictive classroom environment. Um, you know, I think there are some students and families who, I, I would say more the family side of things, because at elementary level, it's usually the families who have more, you know, involvement with that. Um, that can be a really scary time. Um, and, you know, we've been talking as a board about, you know, we're looking at all these pieces and all the things that are the needs in our, in our district. Um, and, um, you know, I think that's an interesting thing to continue to look at is, um, how engaged the families are and how early they're engaged in the process of understanding that that's a positive outcome because it's not always looked at as a positive outcome. And again, lived experience was very scary for me to go through that. So just sharing it as a parent, um, but from a board perspective, it's something that, you know, we continue to look at um, overall. Um, I also just want to make a comment that I'm very excited to hear that the ed assistants are also being trained in trauma-informed education. Um, trauma-informed education, trauma-informed care, it's all a best practice. Um, and I think it makes... The obvious people to do it initially would be administration and teachers, but the fact that it's also bring, bought, being brought to the ed assistant level who pro, levels who may have a lot more one-on-one -on -one contact with students, I think is, is 
it's really good to hear again, like just a lot of really nice things that I'm hearing about them. I'm very happy to hear. Um, I think that's it for you, Mrs. Tiernan, but I'm not done. <laughs> I do I do want to acknowledge uh, Miss Mallory and her team because that's um that's where the trauma informed um PD came from for our educational assistance. So um we we were we're really excited to offer professional development whenever we can to our educational assistants because we don't often have them um present with us for teacher in service days and and we as administrators and teachers have access to some information that we would love for them to have access to too. So she's been, uh, Miss Mallory has been instrumental in making that happen. So I can't take the credit. I just really, um, we're, we're enjoying the uh, benefits at the school level. Um, and, and to your point about the process for special education families, um, you know, as you know, everything that happens for an individual child happens with the team. And so our, um, when our teachers, start identifying students whose progress is significant and they're starting to think about the the um, options that are available in terms of you know moving into a resource room setting or transitioning to a co-teaching setting those conversations start as soon as we start to see that the data is trending in that direction um, but we don't make any of the decisions without the full team which includes the the families so um you know, they really are are an important part of the process. And we have been more um, reserved about transitioning a student if we're on the fence about it, if we're not sure that they're ready for it, both academically and socially. So um, it, it is a careful balance, but, um, you know, ultimately that's our goal is to, is to help them transition to the least restrictive environment. So um, thank you. Thanks. All right. So now Mrs. Giordano. <laughs> Want to. I can't leave anybody out right. Um, so I just think the I so I think one thing that really struck me about your presentation, besides um, I think, you know, many of the things, including, you know, Mrs. Fleischer, I can remember a time when there was not student, there was not a student report out from AHS students. And there's a lot of discussion about why don't our AHS students, why aren't they included in the student reports? And so now they are. So it's fantastic that that we've moved in that direction. It's, you know, strong family and student voice in that. Um, I, um, I, sorry, <laughs> I'm going back to my notes to make sure I hit on it. Um, I think the piece that is also, I just want to highlight too, is um, talking about the academic success your students are having and how integral the supportive SEL environment that you offer. Um, I think there's a sounds to me like there's a pretty clear direct link because you talked really almost exclusively about SEL, but you touched on, on the academics. Um, and I think it's just good for us to, for me, because I was waiting, I'm like, okay, when are we going to hear about the academics? When I go, you know, we're talking about SEL, obviously in the alternative high school, it's a very huge part of the curriculum and the, and the environment. Um, but I just really want to say kudos to obviously a lot of success with how that all fits together. Um, and, and what ultimately that, you know, our students are benefiting from that. Um, it's, it's a, it's a pretty special place, AHS. And I, I think that, um, you know, I just really want to um, acknowledge that. So. Well, thank you um, just so much for saying that. I would say to, you know, this, we've done the quarterly meetings with students where we go over their report card, they complete a survey and we talk about, you know, how can we scaffold to the next or for grade dips? That's what we do every market period. But in the last two marking periods, I mean, to have kids sit in your office and their face when you slide across straight A's and have them tell you they haven't had marks that high since first grade over and over and over again is, you know, I could quantify all the data in the world, but like, that's our work. So thank you for, for seeing that and, and realizing that. I appreciate it so much. Thank you. All right. Last but not least, Dr. Birdie. <laughs> Some middle school things to say. Um, sorry, I know I'm taking a lot of time. This is, you know, the goals and 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 the 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 connection. It's 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 I think worth spending some time on. So, um, I was I mean a lot of pieces that you reported. I was very excited to hear. And I think um, just to kind of circle back a little bit to what Mrs. Winters talked about, which is um, you know the transitional grades. Um, you know I. I hear a lot and I see a lot about sometimes 
it feels like different worlds. Right. Um, and I think, um, again, it's, you know, transitions for all of us bring a lot of uncertainty. So, you know, I think having, um, you know, hearing about having numerous different staff visit, um, and, and observe, um, you know, at the next, at the next transitional level, whether it's going into ninth grade and visiting there and seeing how things are there and what the needs are or fifth grade. Um, I think that's, I'd love, I'd love for that to continue and to grow. I do think that fits very well into how do we, you know, continue to improve what we're doing. Um, so, and, and certainly with, we don't talk about that a lot. Um, I hear some professional language around that sometimes, you know, articulation, vertical articulation, I guess is the phrase that I, I'm not an educator, but that's what I hear. But um, the other piece that I was also really excited to hear, um, and we've had conversations very recently about were um, some of the skills you were talking about that are being taught in, um, in that, um, I'm forgetting what the period of the day, the, the soft skills, the organizational skills, those pieces. But that's our mentoring intervention. Your mentoring yes. intervention. Yep. So that, I also think, um, you know, I, I hear sometimes even from staff how much kids struggle with some of those things, um, especially when they get to the high school level. So starting those in middle school, I think is really, really critical. And I think I'm thrilled to hear that that's happening. I did have a question, and this is enough comments, one question. Um, so um, the, I'm trying to look what it was called. You said you have a new um, student um, govern, no, is it the student governance? No, it's not that one. Um, the transitional coach. How is that different from effective, let's say effective school solutions, which is one of the in-service behavioral health providers that that provides services to students, the counseling services. Yeah, so it's it's not drastically different uh, in terms of in terms of uh, service providers. Uh, they are providing therapeutic counseling. So that that is uh, our our person is an LCSW. Uh, they are a licensed therapist, uh, and they are doing that work during the school day. So I think what makes it different is potentially the uh, way we contract with them because it is through a grant. Uh, and I think um, that that's probably the differences are uh, minuscule compared to the similarities. And I'll Which jump we... in, Dr. Birdie, if that's okay. Over here. Over here. Oh, thank okay. you. <laughs> He's like, where's that voice coming from? So students that are um, seen by Effective School Solutions, it's IEP driven. Okay. Uh, no, thank you. I didn't. I didn't realize it was exclusively students with IEPs. So okay. So this is for this may be students who don't. Yeah, so effective school solutions is and recommended by counselors in certain uh, school school based, depending on the recommendations by the counselor. Um, but Dr. Birdie can speak to the transitional coaches role. So I was going to actually ask Ms. Uh, Ms. Mallory to jump in, but I don't call on anybody at that table without them knowing I'm going to call on them. So I, I thought like I should try to muscle through it. Um, ours is done through our INRS team again, uh, I think. Uh, Mrs. Elmer Stratton asked about that. The INRS team, uh, you know, looks, uh, it, you know, with counselors at what are the needs of the children and for those students who are in need of emotional and, and, and social support um, or even behavioral goals, they recommend to our, uh, uh, our transitional coach uh, and, and they create goals together and they do therapeutic work, again, individual and group therapy at school, uh, Mondays and Tuesdays at Carusi, and then they work with the families uh, and in many cases with the outside providers that the the families already have working in the home. Is this the first year we've had that? So this is our second year. Second year grant. And th this is not the one, the ser that service that's through the county, is it? Because I know we we looked into, maybe it is. My people are telling me, yes, it is. Okay. Okay. So now I know I... It is. Services yes, commission. it's the okay. service of the Camden County Ed Services Commission and the students are free and reduced lunch eligible. Gotcha. Okay. So now I, I, it clicked. Thank you. <laughs> Okay. Very good. Well, thank you so much. That um very helpful. Um great updates. I'm 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 pretty pumped. So thank you. Thank you. Um any other board members have any comments, questions before we move on to our student rep who would like to make a comment or question or both? Yes, thank you. So it sounds like there are a lot of great things going on that impact students. And I just had a couple of quick comments and a question. Um 
first to echo what Ms. Stern said. Uh, as a student rep, I have been very happy to see the alternative high school representation uh, with the updates. Uh, and I think I see Liz nodding her head. I'm sure she agrees. Um, you know, I certainly felt like um, it, it was kind of completing uh, the puzzle of student voice and student representation, um, where when I got up here, I felt like, um, you know, we were representing two of the high schools, but now I think we have every high school represented. So that was great, great to see um, as like a student voice advocate. Um, and then at the middle school level, I have one comment and one question. So um, first, just a comment. Um, I, I thought it was really great to hear about all of the culture clubs and um, the Pride Club and the Women Empowerment Club. All these are great things to see um, that I feel like I didn't have in my middle school experience. I think some of them were there, but I just didn't um, participate in them. But, um, you know, personally, as an LGBTQ plus person and um, as someone who just cares about those issues um, of representation and inclusion, um, I mean, we're in a time where I unfortunately looked up practically every day, including today, there's a new news story about um, schools across our country um, in some some forms, uh, taking away those opportunities, taking away inclusion, trying to not represent LGBTQ students, make them feel included. So the fact that that is happening, not just in our high schools, where I know at East and West that is very strongly represented, but in the middle schools, I think is very important. Um, and then I did have a question just about the, um, for Dr. Birdie, about the uh, therapy and counseling services. Um, that's another thing that I think is a big topic among students. Um, and I know at the high school, there's a feeling um, among many students I've spoken to that um, the resources that are available are very helpful, but that there are not enough of them. And that's something as, you know, the budget discussion comes up today uh, that some students uh, I've spoken with would like to see more resources devoted to. So I was just wondering from your perspective at the middle school level, do you feel like your students, um, is it a similar situation or is there enough resources um, where every student who could use uh, those therapy and counseling services has access to them? Yeah, that's, a, that's actually a terrific question. Um, you know, the, the the real answer is that we we in some way never know how many kids actually need access to those services right we may never know that number because we we work really vigilantly to to identify kids who may be struggling or might need those additional supports um but but the truth is that uh, that number escapes us in many ways because so many of our of our children are good at masking some of those struggles that they that they have um, I will say that one thing we've become very good at beyond providing school-based guidance, counseling, therapeutic support, uh, mentoring, um, is really is really helping families with referrals. Uh, so so we do work, um, you know, our, our guidance staff, our SAC counselor uh, work uh, very closely with families to make sure that uh, if there's a, a resource that we can't provide in school, that they have access to it outside of school. Uh, we use Care Solus. Uh, we use uh, Perform Care. We use many of the local providers uh, that work on a sliding scale, uh, and we are quick to 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 make referrals to outside providers or vendors because we want to make sure that um, all families know how to access those supports should they should they be in need. Um, but your question's a great one, and I'm not totally sure that we know the actual number of. Of, of students in need, but we work really hard to um, to identify the signs and to 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 get to those families that need us. It's great, thank you. Okay, any final questions, comments? Oh, Liz, yes, please. Again, I also want to articulate how grateful we are and how important it is to have a student perspective from the AHS school as well. I often feel as though Cherry Hill is not just two schools, it's three schools, and it's really important to hear from all students because I think that growing up in middle school and like in high school, you, seeing those perspectives and those student voices makes you think that one day you can be one of those too. And then I think that's very inspirational for the students and it helps a lot as a student. And then I had a comment for Mr. Birdie, maybe even a suggestion, but <laughs> so for these culture clubs, I am, I understand that they, a lot of them are growing and a lot of them are new and being part of them myself, I often felt as though sometimes students didn't and then also as well as this with the transitional coaches I often felt as students didn't really know who to reach out to so one suggestion is to go to these culture clubs with this coach 
or with the student advocates to help them realize this is the person that you need to talk to if you want to talk to them. If you have a reason to talk to them, if you just want to sit with them, if you really want to see who they are or they can help you too. And that way people really understand who the person is because I know myself and as a student at West and as a student when I was at Carusi, I was very involved in these clubs and I was a very involved person, but oftentimes I didn't know who that guidance counselor was or who that coach was. It's great, great suggestion. And we're always vulnerable to good ideas. So thank you for that, Elizabeth. Thank you, Liz. That's really, it's nice to hear from both Liz and from Aiden. Um, okay, I think, I think that's it. Thank you so much. Great reports. Look forward to the next one. <laughs> May not be you, but <laughs> okay. All right, thanks. Okay. And now we move on to correspondence. Do any board members have correspondence? I know some of you do. <laughs> Mrs. Tom. Yeah, I was at the East. Um, I went to see the um, Into the Woods. They, the kids did a fantastic job. Um, I was amazed, and I went for the second round. I uh, the two different ca casts, apparently. I didn't know until I found out, wow. Even the second cast, they went on and did the, I guess they all very equal to each other. Excellent, excellent job. So next time, I will continue going for more shows. That's great. Okay. Other correspondence from board members? Uh, Ms. Elmer Stratton, and then we'll go to Mrs. Fleischer. Sure. So first, uh, happy Women's History Month to all the ladies, uh, those that identify as female. Um, I uh, was able to participate in the Sharp School STEM night uh, prior to me going away last week, and um, just wanted to give a special shout out to those uh, families. Uh, it's an event that's really, really put on by the PTA and a lot of volunteers and then the staff volunteers. And it was really exciting to see all of the families uh, really enjoying looking at STEM. They also had some students from East Robotics there uh, sharing with the young people and showing them uh, that that what can happen once you get over to high school. So I thought that was really critical and, and very nice. So it was a really well done event. Um, so kudos to the Sharp School. Uh, and then also uh, for the Camden County uh, Educa Educational Service Commission had their meeting on the March the 1st. So I, of course, attended for us. Um, nothing really new moving there. They also are finalizing budget. So uh, I will send you my few notes, but very little to that affects anything of what we're doing right now. Um, and I think that is it for me. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Mrs. Fleischer. Thank you. Just really quickly, um, Mr. Mayor and I were had the opportunity to be at the Cherry Hill Library last week and when we saw one of the Cherry Hill East alum, um, Ellie Honig, who's the uh, CNN senior analyst. I know Dr. Malash had been there previously when he had written a book and come back. He's a 93 alum from East and uh, it was great to see alum come back and he was um, speaking about his third book um, and that was a great day and a great community uh, outreach. So that was great. Um, and then I just wanted to take the time to just say thank you to Mr. Troutman was not here tonight. He was the 45 year, um, one of one of the teachers. And uh, he was actually my husband's teacher and he was my son's teacher. And he wrote my son, Matt's um, college uh, recommendation. Um, and he, you know, there have been a lot of people in the Fleischer family who had him as a teacher over the many, <laughs> many years. So um, as a family, we wanna thank him, but I also uh, wanna congratulate him. So I just wanted to say that. That's it, thanks. Not a lot of people can say that. <laughs> Okay. Uh, other board member correspondence. Mrs. Winters. I also went to Into the Woods at East. I saw the final performance on Sunday, which was really neat because all the seniors went up on stage. Um, I got a little teary eyed. So I just want to say congratulations to all the seniors. Um, well, to all the students in the performance because the whole thing was phenomenal. Cast, crew, 
pit, everybody was great. But to the seniors who um, it was it was pointed out, they really started high school and everything was virtual. Um, they didn't have the opportunity to do live performance and to see them really just shine. And their final performance as seniors was incredible. So congratulations to the East seniors in that show. Thank you. Okay. Other board member correspondence? Okay. Um, None others. I'll 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 go. I just have a few. Um, I got a chance to go to Rosa on March fourth, and saw Susicle. I mean, there must have been eighty or more kids in that show. It was unbelievable. Um, the excitement, the energy, um, the the set that was there. Um, it was just so well done, and um, you know, just a lot of a lot of young kids who from elementary coming to see it. Um, it was it was great. It was so well done. Great performance. So kudos on Susicle. Um, on Thursday the ninth, I got a chance to go to Carusi. Um, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Parry, who is the uh, instrumental teacher director. I'm not sure what his proper title is instrumental. Um, so he does um, every year, I believe it is a um, an evening for parents and students um, who are in uh, the musical program there, the instrumental program. And it, he calls it surgeon uh, or musician. And he um, does a really impressive job of giving, um, educating. It's a class. It's really, it's an hour long class. Um, for a lot for the parents actually about the benefits of um, musical education and the tie-in between musical education and um, life success, academic success, um, uh, thinking process. Um, so I, as much as I thought I knew about um, as a parent of a child who was a musician in our district previously, um, I learned a lot that night, and the most amazing thing was that he just had the right amount of, um, I would say, information and education, and also um, the kids and music with the kids got to play. So they were so engaged. They were like for a full hour. It, I mean, it was unbelievable, really. Um, so it was a great, great evening. Um, I, you know, was really happy to 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 have been part of that and to really see, um, you know, what's happening over at Carusi with the. Um, those kids over there and you know uh, it was a great night um I also saw into the woods um so I won't need to report on it but you know again lots of really good um lots of ways that our students are experiencing engagement that is exciting it's connecting them to our schools it's keeping them in, in our schools and engaged um and social in socially connected especially in this kind of I guess we're a post COVID time. So, um, you know, so much of that stopped for a while. So it, it's, it's really, it's nice to see all that stuff in person. And I think that was it. Okay. Any last, last call? <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, we will now move on to our first public comment. There will be two opportunities for public comment this evening. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you for calling that. Okay, so we we did have um, the budget report under administrative reports. Thank you for. Uh, I just keep skipping. Um, we that's going to be moved to go through BNF. Yeah, yeah. No, thank you. Um, so we are going to move now to um, yeah because I I skipped it over right from correspondence. Skipping the budget. No, that's definitely going to happen. That is, we are definitely talking about the budget. It's just going to be on in our in our work session. So, sorry, thank you. Keeping me on track, thank you. <laughs> yeah, no, I appreciate it. Keep keep it up. <laughs> okay, back to first public comment. So there will be two opportunities for public comment this evening. The first public comment sec session is for any board action items only, so items 17 through 20. Um, there will be another public comment um, section on, and, on um, other topics, so not specifically board action topics. If you are a student in the district, um, uh, you may comment on any item on uh, the agenda or um, on another school related topic. So you can, it's it's basically a combined first and second public comment period for you if you're a student. And, and if you are a student, I will ask that you please put an S by your name if you're online so that we know that you're a student and you identify yourself that way or um, come up to the podium and, and please um, identify as a student. Um, 
If you would like to speak now, please identify the agenda item and clearly state your name and municipality. We will alternate between speakers here in the room and those who are online. Each speaker will be given a maximum of three minutes to speak. The timer on the screen will indicate the amount of time you have remaining. Public comment is an opportunity for members of the community to comment on matters relevant to the operations of Cherry Hill Public School District or within the authority of the Cherry Hill Board of Education. The board welcomes diverse opinions on relevant matters. Under established federal law governing reasonable restrictions on speech in public forums, statements which demean individual community members or groups or which are irrelevant to the operations of the school district or repetitious will not be permitted. Community members who would like to present information not relevant to the school district are always welcome to communicate directly to the district superintendent, the board president, that's me, and all board members via email or other alternative means. Thank you for waiting patiently. Please state your name and municipality and you have three minutes. Aiden Mongo, Cherry Hill. These two girls, Judith and Leah, sit across the aisle from me on the bus. They've been busting my ball since the beginning of the school year. Sometimes I've tried to let it to not let it bother me, but it does. I would tell my parents and then they would send an email to the school. The girls would be good for a couple of weeks and start back up. So my parents told me to record them. So I did. Because no one would believe that girls would were are being this mean to me. On January 9th this year, it just happened to be my 12th birthday. As soon as I got on the bus and went to my assigned seat, Judith started off by asking everyone if they think- I'm sorry, I just have to ask you um, for privacy reasons not to use other students' names in here. Thank right. you, please continue. If they think I'm retarded. If they didn't answer her, they would just keep asking them till they did. Then the bus ride got worse and worse from there. She said the following things to me. Aiden, do you have a tiny dick? Aiden, are you a lesbian? If I were your mom, I would disown you. Judith repeats this. I mean, she repeats this a couple of times. Aiden, how do you identify? Are you a male? Aiden, can I have a hug? Aiden, will you marry me? All the while... Other kids on the bus are chiming in and following her lead. At the end of the bus ride, out of nowhere, she is, she lunges at me and assaults me. My parents filled a HIB report. The vice principal and the guidance counselor were appalled by the video and told my father that with the video that it was cut and dry. Today I stand here with the HIB report that says no evidence found of a violation. Not every kid is as strong as me or have parents that are involved as mine are. How many more kids are going to take their own life because of bullying under your administration? Fix it and fix it now, or we will have to replace you. Thank you for sharing your information. And if you'd like to follow up with the school, I would definitely encourage you to do that. And you can do that with, with, as well with your family members. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. For okay. We'll go to the line now. And sorry, sorry, I'm a little getting getting to the hands here. Okay, um, I don't see a student on the line, so I'm going to go to uh, the phone number that starts with four eight nine. And if you could please say your name and your municipality and the um, action item agenda, action item agenda that you are um, speaking about. Thank you. Hey, my name is Jeff Potowitz. I live in Cherry, New Jersey. It is 17.2. Vote a no for accepting that four-year grant. Um, from this, from a New Jersey Spotlight, dated February 3rd, 2015, school performance reports new data tracks interest in vocational ed classes. The numbers of students in CTE classes in county vocational schools is almost 100%. Comprehensive high schools with the most popular popular CTE programs were, were, and we in Cherry Hill were number four in that list, Cherry Hill East and also Cherry Hill West. We were number four and eight at 67%. 
in the whole state. We had vocational ed. However, the state desires to turn significant portions of individual comprehensive high schools into vocational high schools while providing less state monetary support than county Votech high schools receive. Example, Votech high schools received a large portion of a, of a recent, over the last few years, statewide $500 million bond. Example, Camden County Votech High School received in direct SFRA formula rate approximately $14,480 per pupil, while we in Cherry Hill will receive an estimated $3,420 per pupil. That's this coming year. That is a difference of $11,000 per student. The state of New Jersey will save millions of dollars per year for state cost of, ex of expanding County Votech schools. As more of our high school is converted to state mandated Votech programs, there will be continued, continual cost shifting by the state onto our local property taxes. If we were to receive an additional $11,000 per year, all right, for students for each student enrolled in these programs, all right, from the state, I would tell you all, vote yes, all right? But based on this grant, how much little it really gives us, it, I feel it is really a Trojan horse for our district to do what the state wants. And I would say vote no, because we're, we're just being underfunded, and that's it. And, uh, and they're going to try to convert a goodly portion of that, of, uh, of that high school into a vacational school to save their money because they're not supporting us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, we come back to the room and we, um, okay, you could say your name, your municipality, and the, action, sure. and the sure. action item. Sure, it's 18.3. Uh, I do want to start off with... Uh, the new public comment is 9.1, and one section of it says, or which are a, a, a relevant to the operations of the school district or repetitive. See, this is a problem for me because- Mr. My, Short, I'm sorry. This yes. is the time just for action items. Please, I know, but I can't, talk, I can't talk about the budget because you've, can, you've, you've you can. censored me. You can't talk about the budget. Okay. Feel free, please. please can I have me. the extra the 15 action. seconds, Madam It's in the action. Present. Please continue. Can I have the extra 15 seconds? We're not extending anyone's public okay. time, so. You interrupted me. Okay, move on. We have a budget of a half billion dollars. I've sent you guys an email, and we can't afford to put extra vestibule locks for $11,000 into the vestibules that are there. This is outrageous. What year have I come up here before and said the same thing? We have no security cameras after eight shots were fired at Cherry Hill West. Eight, shot, eight shots fired at Cherry Hill West, and we still don't have security cameras. Does somebody need to get shot before we put security cameras? What about our parking bullards? What about all the places where we could have parking bullards for the places that are, that are set up? There's 2,493 schools in New Jersey. These 2,493 have, I know of three that are safe, Vincent Town, Mount Laurel, they're safer. Why are we waiting? We have a half billion dollars. Why are we waiting to make our parking drop-offs? Why, why are we waiting? Now, let's get into the, oh, so here we go again, because my interpretation of SEL is different than your interpretation. My interpretation of uh, suicide prevention is different than yours. And my definition of helping the uh, dis disabled people, these are all it relative has, things because it's part of the budget. Please, yeah, just as long as you state it. The yes, that's what that's I'm fine. trying to say, but you keep interrupting me. Again, why aren't you putting any money into S Why aren't you putting any money into anything but SEL because all you do right now is you just promote with your new code of uh, your new dress code you just promote more and more chaos why aren't you investing in some other type of SEL why aren't you why aren't you investing in 
some type of suicide prevention. You're, you're not doing anything. Finally, well, I'm out of time. Okay, then we go to um, Sarah Jocelyn, who's on the line. Um, Sarah, if you could please uh, state your name, municipality, and the action item agenda that you are referencing in your comments. I'm Sarah Jocelyn from Cherry Hill, and the action item is 11.1. .1. This relates to the uh, report. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Ms. Jocelyn. Um, it's items 17 through 20 are the ones we're taking action on. So if you could please come back during our second public comment, and you can um, comment on other items. Okay, back to the room. There's anyone for action item agenda uh, public comment. Okay, and we'll go to the line. Uh, so Laura Pendergast um, uh, is the next person on the line. If you could please state your name, your municipality, and the action item agenda items uh, 17 through 20 that you're referencing, please. Sure. Uh, my name is Dr. Laura Pendergast. I'm in Cherry Hill, um, and I am calling about item 18.3. Um, so I wanted to say that there's a point that I've heard Dr. Malash say many times related to student achievement, and it's really resonated with me. So on many occasions, um, I've heard him say in regard to our students and student achievement, that the longer our students are with us, the better they do. I cannot think of a better possible argument in support of making sure that expanding preschool is included in our budget. I'm absolutely, um, I'll be absolutely thrilled if this is um, prioritized in our budget. Um, let's get more kids in um, to the district earlier. If we know based on our experience and our data that the longer they're with us, the better they do. Um, right now in our community, there's a significant lack of access to affordable early, child, early childhood education and childcare. Right now I have a two-year-old at St. Andrews and a four-year-old at Malberg. And as a working mom, they're both amazing schools that are giving each one of my kids exactly what they need. But as a working mom, half day programs are almost impossible. I'm, luck I'm privileged enough that I have the resources to make it work, but it is difficult. Many families in our community do not have the resources to make it work. This means that kids in our community lack access to preschool and start kindergarten behind their peers. As I think everyone there knows, I'm always happy to send research articles your way. Um, but the research bears out very clearly um, that academic achievement gaps start before kindergarten and um, that access to preschool helps to remedy those. So we've had a lot of talk in our community about achievement gaps. Let's start fighting those achievement gaps at the very first opportunity, which is preschool. Let's make sure that this budget reflects our priority for fighting achievement gaps early. Um, and let's invest in universal preschool on Cherry Hill. Um, thank you so much. And um, happy to send you some research articles. You know, I always am. Thank you. Okay. And we go back to the room. And your name, your municipality, please send the action item you're speaking about. Alani Aris, Cherry Hill, 18.3. Um, I am also invested in preschool expansion, but thinking about my children right now and how the schools are set up, um, my children go to Kilmer Elementary School where there are no self-contained classrooms currently. And I have a student who is at Malberg in a self-contained class. And if he continues to remain there, he won't be able to attend the same, pre the same elementary school that his siblings go to. Um, so I would like for you to look at in the budget to be able to include um, self-contained classrooms at all of the elementary schools. I understand that all special needs programs can't be offered at all elementary schools, but um, I don't think right now he needs a specialized program. He just needs a self-contained classroom that are offered at 10 other elementary schools in the district. Thank you. Okay, we go back to the line. Uh, Ann Einhorn. Uh, name and municipality, please, in the action item. Thank you. And I'm in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. <clears throat> I'm also speaking on 18.3. I was a little confused by your opening remarks, Mrs. Stern. So um, I, I see that it's the submission budget. Um, and I know you're discussing it later. 
But I just want to know currently, is it being submitted with a 2% increase or what type of increase um, is factored into this uh, budget submission? Um, as much as I support all day preschool, I, I, I hope your discussion tonight considers the fact that do we truly have the space? Um, does the submitted budget include the fact that we will have to hire more teachers, potentially assistants? Um, so I have real concerns because I'm really in the dark as to how this plays out into the 23, um, 24 budget. Um, I would like to make a comment on 19.1. Um, the retirements of Nina Bart, James Mork, and Michelle Taylor. Nina, when you retire, I have ideas for what um, and how we can keep your husband busy. Um, Mr. Mark, you have been a terrific influence in our home for many years. Um, you guided my son, who is now a proud instrumental music teacher. Um, you also helped guide him through the master's program with advice, really good advice. Um, I am so proud of you for revitalizing the marching band along with Dr. Morton's support at the time. Um, you couldn't have given a better opportunity to many kids for who that is the one reason that they intent, indeed go to school. Michelle Taylor, I've known you forever. Um, I don't know who's going to replace you, but I thank you for all the care that you've given. We've had many discussions over the years in a private manner um, of how you take care of the kids. And I thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we go back to the room. Okay. All right, if you could state your name, your municipality and the action item you're speaking about. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Yoni Yaris Cherry Hill. Uh, I'm gonna go with the ever popular 18.3 and also reiterate what Ms. Einhorn said is I hope that we go to the 2%. I will be here probably far longer than most people around this table. And I don't want to be back here looking that we dug a hole. Um, but yes, things are challenging, but as costs go up, it's the responsibility of people around this table to fund them. Um, and for us to keep the typical challenges as much as they're financial right now, every student is facing challenges and we need to fund as much money as we can put it there as possible. And for me, I would go into the bank cap if we had to that we have to make sure that we're funding everything. I don't want to hear the word cut. I want to hear that we're constantly looking at extending funding options. Um, along that same line, moving over to 17.2, we need to do more. We need to do more to educate families that CTE is a fantastic way for students to enter careers. This is one of the areas of my research. We need to do more. These opportunities need to be expanded also at East. There needs to be, I don't know what has to happen, but there's a side of this town that does not seem to respect career and technical education. And we must do more around this table to get parents educated, to know that there is, not every student has to go to college to be successful. And in fact, by us pushing students into that, we are potentially putting them at terrible risk for massive debt. Um, so seeing what's gone at West um, through that tremendous leadership, uh, we need to do more of that. And also one last agenda item, um, 18.5. Thank you to the board and to the administration for keeping the commitment to use capital reserve to fund down the debt from the bond. There was a philosophy in this town that people didn't believe that would actually happen. And thank you for doing it for the first year. I look forward to this being part of the budget for the next 19 years as we pay down that debt and possibly doing this can pay it down a little bit faster. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we go back to the line. And we have um, Megan Ahrens, if you could please state your name, your municipality, and the action item agenda you're speaking to. Hi, Megan Ahrens, uh, Cherry Hill, New Jersey, and 18.3. Um, I just wanted to say that I fully support the concept of the full day uh, preschool. Um, I do have some questions about it. I just think that to make it accessible for most parents. I know a lot of people with children in preschool will also have a child in an elementary school in the neighborhood um, and getting, if it's if it would be hosted at its own building and not in the home school, being able to pick up both children at the same time could be really challenging. So if it could be a staggered time coming out of that, that would be, I think, create accessibility for a lot of parents where they could be at both places at once. But I do think starting early and getting people and our getting our students into Cherry Hill education as early as possible and giving them that 
consistency moving from preschool to kindergarten and both being full day is really going to set up our learners for uh, their best case scenario. And that's it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And um, we have one more name. I'm looking in the room. There's not someone at the podium, so I'll go online. Uh, Sarah Jocelyn, um, it, it, if you could state your name, your municipality, and the uh, action item agenda from 17 to 20 that you're speaking on, please. Hi, this is Sarah Jocelyn from Cherry Hill. Um, the, the agenda that's up on the screen indicates the number is 11.1, .1, but I see your agenda item is 17.1, and this relates to the curriculum and, and instruction. Um, particularly, I wanted to speak so, to the summer reading program. Ms. Jocelyn, and, um, I'm yes. sorry, if we're not um, taking action, we're not voting on it tonight. It is not, it is something that I would ask you to hold your comment. So please come back for public comment too. Because we're just, uh, the comment time now is just for action items that we're voting on. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to now close public comment and we will move on to our work session. And I'm going to start with asking Mrs. Winters if you could please um, give the curriculum and instruction committee report. Thank you so much. So curriculum and instruction, we met on March 6th. Um, we had a few items on the agenda. The first one was a doctoral studies proposal. Um, it is a project on character education that is going to be conducted in our schools. Um, it's up for a vote tonight. The second thing we talked about was the summer reading program, which made me super excited because the theme is green reads, which I thought that Dr. Rude would be thrilled about because that's kind of his thing. Um, couple highlights. I was really thrilled to see that there's variety in the genres of books that are being offered to our kids. There's a new graphic novel for our sixth graders, which I think is gonna make it more accessible to them as they make that jump we talked about from fifth to sixth. Um, there's incorporation of a book of shorter essays um, on our middle level as well, which I think is really nice because as we know in the summer, sometimes it's hard to get through a longer book. So I think having a variety of reading modes there is good for kids um, and helps them to sort of get through it. I also wanted to talk a little bit about book accessibility, which is something that we spoke about a lot. Um, students in Cherry Hill don't need to worry that they won't be able to access or afford these books because the books will be available both in ebook format and audiobook format through Sora, as well as hard copies through the individual schools. And I just want to give a plug to our fabulous Cherry Hill Public Library, which always has a huge display of summer reading books available. Any Cherry Hill student who wants to go over there and grab a library card um, can borrow the summer reading books. They always do a great job at making sure those are stocked and ready to go. So we will, um, I'm going to be doing a lot of reading with the rest of the other CNI members. I'm really excited to read all these books um, and go over them and see what they, what they look like. They sounded fabulous. We also had a report on preschool expansion, which is a hot topic tonight. Um, Dr. Mahan and her team have been working really, really hard on getting information about how expansion could work in our district, getting information from other districts as well as from the state. So I thank her for that. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the funding for preschool because it's a little confusing because it's different pots. There's preschool expansion aid, which we will be applying for. That opportunity is going to be in the summer, and that is funded on a per pupil basis. And because we're transitioning from a half day preschool program right now to full day, we would be eligible for that money as a transition from the half day to full day program. So that's kind of one pot of money, and that's done as a per pupil amount. And they give amounts that are done by each county. And the amount varies whether it's a Head Start program, which we don't currently have in Cherry Hill, whether it's a program being housed in districts, so in our building classrooms, or whether it's through a community provider. So the model that the state prefers and the model that's worked in a lot of other places is that the district partners with community providers to house preschool classes. And that's something that um, Dr. Mahan and her team have been actively working on is reaching out to those community providers and also looking at how it's worked in other places. So that's a really neat thing that's on the horizon. Um, but I think the state also recognizes that it's difficult to find classroom space in districts. They're also opening another pot of money, which is a facilities grant program that will be available. Um, that application process was announced to be March to May. I haven't um, seen the grant proposal yet, but that's something we could hypothetically consider if we're looking to house more preschool classrooms in district is applying for that grant 
to um, have more classroom space located in our schools. And another piece of it that the governor announced um, is that he also recognizes there are significant startup costs in year one for preschool. So he's also going to do um, grants that have to do with startup costs specifically for that. Because when you think about it, when you're creating new classrooms, there are gonna be a lot of one-time purchases like books and furniture, like all those things it takes carpets to furnish a classroom. Um, so those are sort of, there's several separate pots of money that we are thinking about trying to access. Um, the other thing about preschool is that it's a five-year rollout. So it's not like we're going to, I mean, it's good and bad, right? We're not being asked to serve everybody in year one, but we're also going to have to wait to serve everybody until we get to year five. So the idea is to think about how we can manageably and cautiously and making sure we're doing a really good job, roll the program out so that we're serving our kids really well. Um, because I, I don't know about you know the rest of the board, but I'd rather see it uh, done well than done quickly. Um, so that's something that we're, we're thinking about too. So the timeline would be um, for implementation this fall. In order to do that, we're already thinking about you know, how we convert, like I said, those half day programs to full day. Um, because of the timing, the unfortunate timing in my mind of the preschool expansion aid process, it requires us to have money now to start that transition from half to full day and without knowing for certain whether we will be able to receive the grant in the fall. Um, all indications I have is that there's a high level of certainty that we will. Um, and that's what I anticipate happening. But that, you know, is, of course, a question mark out there. And the last thing that I wanted to talk about is that our committee continues to um, discuss issues around student achievement and try to get a better idea of how the very many things that are going on in this district work to support that. So um, Dr. Mahan and Dr. Morton and Ms. Mallory have been doing a great job educating the committee. And last month's um, presentation had to do with implementation processes for content areas um, and the cycle of implementation, which was really neat because we actually have different content areas in different stages of implementation right now. So to sort of get an idea of how that works on a timeline and all the different pieces that are in place, it's kind of mind boggling to see all the work that goes on. Um, and it was really informative for the committee and expanded our knowledge and understanding as we move forward. So that is CNI. Does anybody have any questions? Any other committee members? For anybody? Committee members first, maybe Ms. Elmore Stratton. Thank you, Ms. Winters, for uh, the, the thorough report and the notes as well. Um, my question, you referred to the other um, RFP opportunities that are associated with preschool. So is it an assumption that we would go for those as well or that we would be eligible for those additional awards? I mean, I think, you know, from what I understand, what I have so far right now is the governor's announcement and the press release that he did on it. I haven't seen um, the particular qualifications. Dr. Mahan, do you have more information than I do on that? I haven't seen anything official yet. Now, he, of course, announced that the application period would start March 1st, and I'm looking at my calendar, and it's March 14th, so here we are. So, you know, hopefully sooner rather than later. Um, but I'm, I'm, op I'm optimistic about it. I think, you know, Cherry Hill is a bellwether district in the state. No other large suburban district as large as ours and suburban has done preschool expansion. They're looking for districts to model it. So I'm extremely optimistic on our chances um, to access that because they will, from everything I have heard from the state, from Rutgers who we work with, there's an opportunity here for us to be a showcase really for what this program can be and the benefits are huge. So if we're able to act, we've been complaining for years and rightfully so that we do not get our fair share of state funding. In my mind, this is a way that we can get some money back from the state and do something really wonderful for our kids and set the foundation so that as they come into our awesome full day K program, they're as prepared as they can be. As we, If we can recoup and, and grab some of that state money and make this happen, I think it would be really cool for our district. I like that. And I, I like that if... if if we are doing it as the first, then we can create some best practices, then possibly that can access some more dollars as well. So I really enjoy that piece of it. Uh, my other question was around, hold on. On the achievement discussion um, is, and I, and I missed curriculum and instruction. I was out last week. Um, for the blueprint and how we talked about the implementation, does that mean that we also got presented with like 
I know we had discussed last month, like seeing how we can look at achievement as a whole and not just in those specific areas, or are we still working on trying to put together something like that? We're building towards that, I think. I think after the discussion that we had in February, what came out of that conversation um, that Ms. Staffen did was uh, questions about understanding where we were in the implementation timeline for different subject areas. So that was the focus of this month's presentation, because that was sort of a missing piece as we build towards what you're talking about for the future, looking at um, student achievement all the way from K to 12. Okay. And thinking about that. I don't think, I think the, the committee decided we weren't quite ready for that yet because there's still a bunch of missing chunks that we need in order to get there. Yeah. Um, but I'm happy to share, of course, all the all my notes as scattered as they are and all the information from the committee meeting with you. No, I just I I I know we had asked for that and I I know that the admin team was working to put together something. So I just wanted to know if I missed out on that as well. So thank you, you and Dr. May. Yeah. Any other questions, Ms. Gallagher? I have a couple. Shocking, right? Um, So (laughs) we like them. So hypothetically, this grant that you're applying for that we would find out, I think it's, you said August, is that, okay. How long is that grant going to be available? So this is the neat thing. It's not really a grant. It's a funding stream. Okay. So the way preschool expansion aid works is that you're, think about it like you're applying for it as if it's a grant, right? There's a grant application. But then once you're in the program, it becomes a funding stream the way that we have already have funding streams from the state. So we could assume that that funding stream will go on forever. I mean, Trenton can do whatever it wants. Having worked there, I can tell you that. So that's more my, (laughs) so that's more my, like, have, has the, I assume Mrs. Sugars has run the numbers. Um, all of you have, but my, my, my one, like my question is, is that exact concern is that, you know, the government giveth and the government can take it away, right? And so what I'm a little concerned about is if for some reason the funding either dried, because I mean, hypothetically, if a ton of districts in the state get the funding and they start to provide full preschool to theirs, that like the money, like the the amount of money is going to get smaller and smaller as it's divvied up among. But my question is, is have, have we... Um, have we sat down and said, okay, at full capacity, this is how much it will cost us in the event that the the state funding does stop or it's or it's limited? So I'll say this. I mean, I think I have two sort of pieces to answer that question. First of all, while this program is new for us, it's not new for New Jersey. Mm-hmm. So it's based on the Abbott preschool program that's been running in the state for the last 20 years. And preschool has been expanded in a lot of different ways through the years. There were things called ELLI grants. Like there were different ways that the state tried to do it. But now the model is this preschool expansion. um, And the way that they're doing it is by having districts apply it. There was actually different thresholds based on free and reduced lunch for who could apply first. So I think they're rolling it out thoughtfully. So I don't think it's not a never ending application where everybody can be all in this year and suck up all the money. Actually, last year they couldn't get enough districts to apply to give the money away. They actually had money available at the end of the application process and did a second round in January. So I I understand your concern, but right now I think really they're looking for people to buy into this program and expand it. Um, Not that they're pushing people away because they don't have the money. And my understanding is that it's going to be a continuing funding stream the way that they continually fund K-12 education. I, like I said, I, I can't guarantee that forever and ever it will be what it is, but I can tell you that the per pupil amount that we would be getting based on the numbers looks really good mm-hmm. and is sufficient to meet the needs of the program. Okay. Sure, Ms. Elmer. Just to add context to it as well for Ms. Gallagher, I, I, you know, obviously we can, none of us can predict, we're all familiar with state RFPs and grants and all that stuff. And you can never predict as soon as the politics change or the governor changes. But I think it's important to note that this is something that's going to be mandatory right. for districts eventually. So we do have to take a look at it. And and I like that you're thinking without the money being there, what are we, are we focusing in on that too? But I think that the budget proposed for this RFP is a, a good baseline for us to look at in terms of implementation. 
Um, and then in future conversations, we should always keep that number as our as our baseline to have in the budget uh, lines or whatnot for as we're going moving forward. But just wanted to be clear that it's pretty soon this we won't have a ch uh, a uh, what do you call a, 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 a choice a choice in right. um, in doing this. I'm sorry, my brain is still in Disney. It should be. And I mean, Ms. Gallagher, it's just to echo what Ms. and amplify what Ms. Elmore Stratton said. I think the reason why I I feel fairly strongly the time is now is because the money is here now. This is going to full day pre-K in New Jersey is going to happen. Whether, you know, we're ready or not, here it comes. And I would rather if the governor, this current governor is so invested in this opportunity and is giving money away to make the implementation easier, I think it's to our advantage to access that money now, because especially something like the the grants to build classrooms, that's something that I don't think that opportunity is going to be something that's there forever. I think that's an incentive right now that I'd like to take advantage of, because as we all saw through the bond, construction is expensive. Well, and that, oh yeah, and that was going to be my next question is like, is the plan to create a preschool building or is the plan to like expand elementaries? Because the question, like, so talking about the bond is we have created a, we have set plans to maintain, update, reconfigure buildings without preschool, right? And so like, if now all of a sudden we're like, no, now we're, we need to add, do you know what I mean? So it's like, we've already invested $360 million in these updated projects. The last thing I want to do is be like, well, now we have to, you know, not necessarily waste that money, but now we need to come back and say, okay, now we need to redesign buildings that we've already just redesigned. And then also considering the fact, like if we're going to put three and four-year-olds in an elementary school, like does the playground, like, you know, cause I mean, three and four-year-olds are going to need different play areas than like kindergarten through fifth grade, you know what I mean? So just questions like that. And then the other question I had was I saw that the transportation element is covered through the grant in the for the revenue stream, whatever you want to call it in the first year, but then the districts um, need to cover that cost moving forward. And have we talked to our transportation providers to make sure that like the infrastructure is there? So I think what I would say to both of those things, and then I can, you know, see if there's anything that needs to be added. But I mean, these are great questions and ongoing current conversations. And I'm really excited to have these conversations with everybody on the board of the administration. I mean, this is what I wake up at four in the morning thinking about all the time <laughs> is it's, it, you know, it is both an exhilarating and terrifying and wonderful opportunity for us. Um, and just because of the size of our district, it, it's a big project and a huge lift. And I think it's going to take everybody working on it together. Um, so I, everything you said is, you know, something that I am currently thinking about. And I think we're going to have to have, you know, conversations going forward about that. Um, I will say that, like, I wouldn't, especially with the facilities piece, just it's not going to be everybody housed in district. Like the model is definitely co-partnering with, you know, community providers. That's going to be, and the state encourages that. And that's something when they're looking at the applications that they're looking to see. Um, and we have lots, the advantage to Abbott happening 20 years ago is that we have lots of models of how that's worked. So it's not like we're reinventing the wheel here. So I think, you know, this isn't something we're going to figure out tonight, but I think it's something that we're going to have ongoing conversations about moving forward. And, you know, just so regarding um, the providers, um, how how will we determine who will go to a district? I know these are probably, but but we but like we are going to have some providers for next year as well, correct? It, assuming everything goes forward next I mean, year, there impossible. would be a couple. I mean, I, really, at this point, like I love your all your questions, and like I said, this is what I think about at three in the morning. But I think they're we're not quite there yet. If okay. that makes any sense. So the sort of the the complex problem we're working on here is that the budget is now right but the preschool the preschool process is later and i mean it's unfortunate that the state set it up this way because all of these sort of puzzle pieces need to fit together but we need to think about um the ex the budgetary implications now when we don't have all of those complex answers 
of program design. Sure, Ms. Elmore Stratton. Just as a committee member, I would also encourage um, Mrs. Gallagher and other board members, if you have specifics like that, we, we are definitely uh, grilling the team. Um, I, I, I will say right off the bat, I said, no, we can't do this. Dr. Mahan has too many things to do, but <laughs> um, but I know that we have to and, and preschool is important and this is really gonna help us with achievement and, and really touching children at an early stage. So I get the value of it, but we have those same um, thoughts that you're having. So I would encourage you to send those questions to Gina prior to our next curriculum meeting. Um, and she'll make sure, uh, she'll she'll hold our speed to the fire to make sure we get some oh, answers to it. Um, you know, and, and some of those detailed answers she has already gotten for us and provided. So I think they're in some of the backup. Dr. Mahan has, but I, I would definitely reach out to Gina prior to next month and give her your specifics on that. And then the other piece about the transportation, I think just for me coming as a service provider on the outside thought, th there's no way to predict that in terms of infrastructure wise. Because right now, if you were to go to any of these bus companies at this current moment and say, could you fulfill our needs? They would say no. So, and, and that's with our current needs of where we are. So I think we, we can make some projections, but you know, with, with busing going from $250 in 2020 or 350 in 20, 2019 to now being 600 to 650 in 2022, is just, it's a little bit too hard to do, but we can definitely base the cost on what was spent in our first initial year, I think. The other piece is transportation is that a lot of kids are going to require before and after care. And if they need before and after care, then we're not required to provide them the transportation like their parents. It's the same thing with morning and afternoon sack, right? Like if your preschooler needs a school day that's, you know, 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. because those are your working hours, then that preschooler is not on the bus. So it's, it's, there's a lot of moving parts here. And it's, you know, I think that's why the five year rollout is important. I think if we had to rip the bandaid off and serve everybody year one, it would be chaotic, right? Because there's just too many things. But I think the slow rollout is going to give us the chance to sort of figure out how to do it, what works. And I think also the fact that so many other districts are doing this at the same time, and there's lots of support coming um, from the National Institute for Early Ed Research at Rutgers, um, who has studied these issues for the past 20 years. Like there's a lot of places that we can get um, support and understanding and learn about how other districts are doing it. So it's not like we're making this up on the fly. No, and, and listen, I don't want to come off across thinking like I'm against preschool. I obviously see the value in it. I just, I just feel like there's a lot of questions that, you know, I mean, and if now all of a sudden more districts are getting the funding, we're now competing for that infrastructure, right? So like, and I know if there's before and after care, but finding SAC is like having SAC provide, like having enough staff at SAC has been a problem. And like, we can't even fully support our current SAC programs. Um, so like, I'm just going to use a little anecdote. So like my husband and I just needed to go buy a car. My stepson has his driver's test tomorrow, as Mrs. Wethington knows. Hopefully he passes. Um, and the, the, the salesperson was saying, oh, there's like no inventory out there. There's no inventory out there. And so my husband and I felt like we made a quick decision. We bought a car. And as we're driving home, I'm like, that car was way more expensive than we needed. It didn't have the, the things that we wanted there's called the scarcity of choice in economics. And my concern is because we're being waved a carrot, I don't wanna jump into something so quickly and not necessarily do it incorrectly, but do it in a way that we could have done better. Um, and so I, I get that there's like a lot of moving parts and all that stuff, but it wasn't until after like, I really started thinking about the logistics of it all is when I was like, wow, like this is a pretty large undertaking. And, um, right? And, um, you know, and when you start to think about the the ripple effects of, it's not just, you know, getting 160 pre like kids next year, it's then you're essentially doubling the size every year after, you know? And so, and then when I noticed the transportation element, I'm like, gosh, we can't even get enough buses already. Teachers are, you know, so it's just this, this thought of um, the last thing I want to do is, is, is this then also, I mean, negatively impact the students we already have. Um, Cause you know, we're already servicing, you know, over 10,000 students. 
And, um, I, you know, it's just when I'm asking these questions, it's, I get that, like, you can't have the answers to everything, but, you know, it's just something that I've been thinking about, you know, too. So, I mean, I encourage like, so a couple of things, number one, definitely email me all your questions and all the questions. Yeah, no, I mean, this is, this is a complex project. Email me all the questions, join in the conversation. Like I, this is not, this is an all hands on deck moment. I mean, this is not something that, you know, if you have ideas, concerns, thoughts, like send them to me, you know, I, I welcome and encourage diverse thoughts and opinions and ideas and you think differently than I do, maybe you'll come up with something that I didn't even dream of. It'll make it better. I mean, I'm totally um, welcoming of that. And, but I also think, you know, when you, one thing I will take issue with is when you talk about like, oh, is this going to negatively impact our, our K-12? You know, there is nothing, there is nothing that I can think of that is as research-based as preschool that shows the benefits that preschool shows when you look at it over time. And I don't think it's a scarcity thing that just because, you know, we're doing this for K-12 over here, that we're going to somehow take a slice of that pie and away from other kids and stick it in preschool. I think it's a growth moment for the district and a value add. Um, and I mean, obviously, that's that's just my perspective of it. Um, but I don't think, I think that, you know, when given an opportunity to address some of the concerns that we've all been talking about and there's state money available to do it, I don't think that our fear should be what, our fear that we might damage something else should stop us. I think if we all put our heads together and work on it and go slow so that we're making sure that we're doing it in a thoughtful manner and listen to our experts and listen to other districts who have done it, I think we can do it well. I have a lot of faith in us. Mr. So yeah, it's, it's a couple of thoughts and the great discussion. And, and I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's generating more, right. And, and I think, you know, the committee members probably have had more in, engagement in the conversation or the most engagement, um, uh, aside from the, the administration who's done the most work and had the most just conversations. So, um, but, um, you know, I, a few, I think about a few things. Um, one, um, I think about, how pieces all tie together. So you, you're, you know, I, I think it's a very important question about how sustainable is this, right? The sustainability aspect of it. Um, and I think the, the truth of the matter is that, you know, in 2008, that's the year that the SS, SFRA formula was passed, was, um, <clears throat> and then a new governor came in and then funding was slashed. Um, so you, you know, it, it it is hard to say what is going to happen. And the truth is, whether we like it or not, we are at the mercy of what happens in Trenton to a, to a point that we're impacted by what happens at Trenton. You know, right now we're in a moment where year over year, Trenton and this leadership that's in, in, in Trenton right now is in ex high support of funding education. End of story. Hard stop. We've seen it year over year re in recent years. And not just funding education, but expanding funding for education in ways that when I sat in budget hearings in Trenton, I never dreamed of what happened because we were, you know, we were we were trying to fight for more than 49% of what we were supposed to get per student. The piece that was helpful for me to hear that I just want to share is that when it becomes a funding stream, what that means is the SFRA formula that we're getting that we is supposed to be what we're getting per student, the new per student amount will then flow into, that will also start to be, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, applied to preschool students. So it's gonna expand the overall budget and the overall um, uh, you know, per student um, amount that we get, per, funding we get per trend, from Trenton. So that was helpful for me to, to understand that piece. Um, I would agree and I, I would, looking at someone who who's on our board who works in higher education was nodding, you know, nodding his head like that, that the, you know, this is a window of opportunity for funding for facilities. And actually that just came about recently. That was a new add on. And, and what I keep seeing is I keep seeing Trenton adding and adding and adding, trying to push districts to be willing to take this enormous lift, this big leap. 
Um, and I think, you know, uh, you know, Ms. Ms. Elmer Stratton has talked about that. I just, it's going to become mandatory. So we can, the way I see it is we can wait for it to become mandatory and, and kind of, kind of observe, which is not a bad, sometimes it's not a bad move to wait and see where, where it goes. But I am very concerned that this window of opportunity for funding for our facilities, which is a rare, I mean, you know, they just, the state just brought back rod grants. I don't know, Lynn, what was, how long, Mrs. Sugars, how long was that? 20, 15 years, 10 years, 20 years? I don't know how long it's been since rod grants have even been available. Sorry. Okay. I'll scale it down. Seven or eight years. But I mean, you know, in, you know, in my length of engagement with, with funding stuff, which is only, which is only about that long, um, there haven't been rod grants. So like there's, there's, there's things that are becoming available and and the preschool piece seems to be a, a larger and larger carrot that I'm I'm just in this year I'm seeing. Um and it's and this is year two, right? That is year two. So um the other thing I just want to say, and Mrs. Sugars has taught me this as well, is that um because of the size of our district, there are there's a level of leveraging that we are successful in that sometimes smaller districts have trouble with, like busing contracts. Um, because if we have a busing company um, that we award contracts to, it's lots of contracts and it's lots of it's lots of work. So the ones and, and so it, it is an advantage for us. It's not easy and we've struggled. We I mean I can I can remember sitting in zone PTA meetings and hear Dr. Malash trying to convince zone PTA presidents to open bus companies so that for years, because you've seen this coming for years and you've talked about it for years. Um, so it just in terms of a long, long-term perspective, a longevity look, I think, um, you know, just sharing from where I sit, it makes a lot of sense, not to mention the impact on families and access for our families to affordable, or perhaps even it will be for them free right? Because it's part of their public education at, you know, preschool, which is a huge win for our families and the students, the piece about the undeniable link to achievement. Um, it just, the, the, the hardest piece of this is that it's coming, the information is coming piecemeal. It's, it's slow to come and it, and, and most importantly, it's an enormous lift for our, for our administration and our staff. I mean, that's, I think is honestly, when I look at it, that's the biggest piece, you know. Um, I don't know if you're the only one being kept up at night <laughs> thinking about it. Um, so that's going to be tough. And the timelines are strange and tight. Like, there's just a lot of pieces that are tough. But, um, and I don't mean to keep looking at you, Mrs. Gallagher, but you brought up these questions. So I just kind of wanted to share with you as a committee member um, and, and to other board members, like, that's just kind of like, you know, those are the pieces where I think it it ultimately... I think if we don't go for this window of opportunity, then we're leaving money on the table. We're leaving, more importantly, we're leaving a very important academic opportunity for our students on the table and also for our families. And this is our fair share. And, and by the way, a little plug for fair funding, you know, um, it's all the more reason why it makes a huge difference when our families and our community members call in and tweet and whatever to support fair funding. It's why we have to keep pushing that topic. Okay. Um. Just two things and then I'm done. First of all, I just, I get, I get a little, it's not free, it's taxpayer paid, right? So like whether it's our local taxes or our state taxes, the, the taxes are what's going to be funding. Yes, of course, I, I may not have to pay a fee to send my child there, like in addition to my taxes, but I think it's it's erroneous to necessarily call it a free program. And then secondly, I guess I was under the assumption that the busing for three and four-year-olds is actually a different type of bus. So for, so yes, I understand we can leverage, but like if it's just not like a big yellow bus, you know, if I guess my question is, is more with the infrastructure, it's like, have you talked to like Hillman, TNL, all those busing companies to, to see if they, like, is the state going to, gonna fund their expansion as well like that's the question so like it's it's I understand that it's all a lot of moving pieces but and I get that we have leverage to our size but it's not like it's just a regular bus that we would need to use it would be those companies also investing in 
the preschool programs that the state's providing. So that was all I was trying to. So thank you. I mean, Ms. Gallagher, join the conversation. There's plenty of things to think about and worry about and get up at four in the morning and a sweat about. So you can yeah. join me. <laughs> um, and I, but I, I do, I, I just do want to close with this because it's been a, a long and wonderfully productive conversation. But I, I think, you know, did you have a question, Ben? Dr. Rood? Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see you raising your hand. Dr. Rood, please. You were, it was a subtle hand raise. You have to like hit me from the side. I just want to quickly add like there's there's so many working parts that it's terrifying to think about all at once but this because of the benefit of tr of the early childhood education of, of preschool I think it's so it's so important that the that fear of failure is something that we we overcome and the kind of one of the I've been sitting here and one of the ways I've been thinking about it and and this maybe this will be controversial I'll see if somebody yells at me later um I'm like let if let's say we go for it we get the grant and it all works out and then five you know six seven years from now new governor funding streams close and we fail and all of a sudden we can't sustain preschool and we're like we have to shut you know the district is like we have to shut down preschool that sucks. That's going to hurt. It's going to hurt a lot, but maybe that'll, you know, I'm sorry, but maybe that'll wake up, wake up Cherry Hill and get people to start going to Trenton and being like, Hey, give us our, give us our fair share. You haven't, you haven't done it in 20 years. Maybe it'll wake, wake people up that that's a worst case scenario and a silver lining to a bad situation. But I'm um, definitely, this is a situation where I think, you know, like I, I think the benefit if it works is so much so much bigger than you know than not doing it or the feel fear of of failure and and i i think that you're bringing up incredible points and at each committee meeting and at each meeting we should be asking those hard questions of okay like if we want to do this how are we going to do it like tell me how we're going to do it i think i think that's really important i appreciate your questions but i just wanted to to you know don't be, let's not be afraid, yeah. Are there any more questions? Ms. Tong, did you have a question? Um, yeah, I just wanna thank um, having the pre-scooters. I think it's a good opportunity for us to, you know, check try it out. I think it's a good it's a good discussion, but we can continue with that. Uh so I think uh send an email to Miss Gina Winters. <laughs> yes, everybody email me. <laughs> Aiden Root. Okay, very, very briefly. Um it's not related to preschool, but summer reading. Um since we're still technically in the CNI committee discussion, not just preschool. Um are you gonna read all the books with me? I I would love to. I actually, The Martian is The Martian is my favorite book. So, um, yes. But um, speaking of which, I love all the books. I think these are all great selections. I think um, I love seeing diverse female authors written on uh, an official document. I love all of this. Um, with that said, summer reading has definitely been a student voice topic that I have heard a lot about. And um, for the board, I would say, um, in your piece, just approve this I think it's great um, in terms of more the administrative element and uh, curriculum and instruction administration especially um, I do want to just bring up what I've heard from students and this is something that um, east side is coming out next week and there will be a editorial about this it's been discussed a lot at east um, I definitely think that this great list of five books for students to choose from uh, and uh, really focus on this great sustainability topic it's amazing about, um, well, I was going to say half, probably not half, but a significant portion of students, in my experience, will read those books and then barely touch on them. Because the way summer reading has functioned at East, in my experience, and in the experience of many of my peers, is that if you're in an honors or AP class, um, the list of books that is under the uh, books for this year, the choice books, will be 
the focus um, because those are part of the AP curriculum. AP classes have limited time frames. Teachers want to um, quickly get to those AP texts um, or honors texts. And so I have definitely read some amazing choice books and then talked about them for one class period at most and moved on. And so something that I've heard from students is that if the board and administrators creating these these lists and these great programs of um, themes and all these amazing uh, reading opportunities would communicate with teachers and talk to them about what is the actual implementation of this going to look like in classes and how will student work be used? Because I know I've talked to a lot of students who were kind of demoralized when they spent their summer reading this book uh, spending days annotating and doing all this work. And then their teacher looked it over and said, okay, we're moving on to the AP book. Um, I don't fault teachers for that, but I think that um, I'm so excited to see this list of books, but I hope that um, the steps that need to be taken will be taken so that um, that excitement can translate into the classroom and into productive um, student experiences, because I know I've heard from some students at East that that has not always been the case just due to the structure of the courses. So I hope that these books will go into effect. Students will read them. They'll have a great experience with them. I just think that communication about like um, how that's going to be implemented is important. And, you know, even if it stays that way, if uh, AP books have to be the focus, students would like to know that because then maybe they spend more of their time focusing on those books. And then maybe um, the committee can focus on that. So I think it's just an important piece so that everyone is on the same page because I think that some students don't know that that's how it works and they get excited about these books and then they're surprised when they come into the classroom. So if there's more understanding of that, I think that helps everyone. Thank you. Anybody else for CNI? All right, wonderful. Thanks so much, everybody. Okay, great. Thank you. And we move on to the business and facilities. Mr. Mayor, if you could please um, give the committee report. I will. And um, thanks to uh, tonight's agenda, it's going to be a brief report, at least for me, um, because uh, two of the two of the big um, components were, well, first was um, the audit report out. We had an opportunity tonight to hear from uh, Mike Holt, who gave um, summary of of the audit. Uh, he did a, a slightly shorter version of that for us last week. Um, we you've all heard that, and you've heard it directly from him. I just want to um, point out um, how incredibly rare it is for um, for a school district or a school to a um, be able to cooperate the way that our district did with the auditors uh, and to come through with no recommendations no findings no comments that doesn't happen um, and i know that because when i was chief compliance officer at new jersey higher education students assistance authority um, i was also director of the audit unit so we audited the colleges in new jersey for specific issues but I cannot recall a single audit that did not include at least some recommendations or comments, and most had one or two findings. Um, so the fact that um, that that the audit that we went through, and this is you know several years in a row, um, has come through with flying colors, no findings, no no corrective action at all or recommendations is. A testament to uh, Mrs. Sugars to the work of the finance team. Um, it ju that just does not happen. So don't sit here and think, okay, well, we got through the audit. He didn't really pay attention. It's very, very rare. Um, it's, it's it's great work, and you, we should feel very confident. Um, we also <clears throat> met with um, the two finalists for the construction manager role. Construction manager um, contract is due to be, well, the current one expires with new road construction this early summer or late June. Um, so we need to, um, uh, we're gonna, we're gonna vote um, on, not tonight, on a new, on a construction manager, whether it be new road or Greyhawk, that was the other finalist. We had an opportunity to hear from both. Um, identical questions were presented to both. So we have a, a good, a good op opportunity to compare them we have not had the time since then to focus a lot on that because it's budget season and we've been dealing with the budget um almost ex not exclusively but 
just haven't had the time to have those conversations, but we will. Um, and we will make sure that everyone is aware of, of what we're thinking and we, so we can, uh, we can make a, uh, an informed decision as to where to move, um, how to go forward with our uh, construction manager. Finally, I don't have to talk too much about the small budget item that we, um, that we discussed in, uh, in committee because Mrs. Sugars is going to present the administrative report on the budget. Um, I'll preview that by tying into um, Dr. Rood's comments um, on preschool by saying uh, there should be no fear of failure um, in preschool because of the work that the budget, um, Mrs. Sugars and the team did on the budget. Um, there will be no financial failure. There may be a lot of work, um, but we're that's why we're here. Um, so I look forward to doing that work and helping, um, but I'm going to turn the microphone over to Mrs. Sugars for her administrative report out on the 23-24 uh, budget. All right, tonight we are, tonight we're gonna to talk about the uh, initial submission budget for the 23-24 school year. Uh, this budget is due to the county by Monday, March 20th. Um, therefore, uh, we need to come to some consensus, which is why our resolution is on the agenda tonight. Um, so we're gonna talk about um, where the budget stands as it is right now. So, um, you know, we break down our budget each year in some rather broad categories, and typically I will divide the uh, budget expenditures between what we call the distributed costs and the undistributed costs. And the first group of the distributed costs are costs that can be attributable to a specific grade level, classification, program, basic skills, bilingual, uh, extracurricular, and athletics. Um, and so when we take a look at where our spending is um, for those groups of uh, expenditures for 23-24, uh, and we, we often compare it to 22-23, and then we also have the actual numbers uh, for 21-22, which is the audit that we just talked about tonight. 22-23 um, is the year that we're in right now, and then we compare that to 23-24. And we can see here that um, we will see an increase in uh, our costs um, of um, about 4.5 million or 4.6% uh, in those categories. Uh, bulk of that difference in those categories is uh, salary increases, um, increases in services, um, in addition, uh, increases in uh, the preschool program that would fall under the regular education budget line item. So that would have supplies and salaries uh, that would be attributable to the preschool program. So overall, we can see there that that first group of costs, our education costs, our distributed costs are going to increase uh, 4.5 uh, million, about 4.6%. And then if we look at our next category of costs, um, these are our undistributed costs. So these are not directly attributable to a grade level or a classification. These are more costs um, that service the district. And so out of this category of costs, we have our out of district tuition, student services would include things such as the guidance office, the child study team office, uh, extraordinary services, speech services, uh, the nurse's office, those kinds of things that serve student needs. Uh, so we have student services, then we have curriculum, media and instruction um, that would include um, our curriculum office, our media, our media would be our libraries and instruction would be improvement of instruction. We then have maintenance and secure, or I'm sorry, administrative costs. Administrative costs in terms of the state's definition is um, the business office, the superintendent's office, the principal's offices and the technology office. So that's what makes up the administrative um, cost as the state defines it. Then we have our maintenance and security costs transportation costs, and then our employee benefits cost. 
And we can see there that um, our total costs are going to increase um, significantly, significantly uh, 6.9 million in that category, or about 5.6%. A lot of the increases that we're seeing in this category um, pertain to special education student services, uh, large uh, increases in transportation, including $750,000 for transportation uh, for the preschool program. And to answer your question that you posed earlier, um, I have I may have had initial conversations with our transportation supervisor because until we finalized the budget, you know there was no reason to send her into total panic. Um, but you know you are looking at um, smaller buses. You're looking at buses with car seats in them because if the student weighs less than forty pounds, they need to be in a car seat. Um, and yes, I have concerns about whether or not our contractors are going to be able to meet those, those needs, particularly if more districts in the area are implementing preschool programs. Now, we, we do provide transportation now for our special needs students in the preschool program. We do not provide it for our, our um, typically developing students. Um, so we will lose like that midday run that we have now because the programs are half day programs. Um, but that that'll be a you know, a small decrease versus a large increase in terms of transportation. So I do have concerns about that. Um, we're also seeing a large increase in employee benefits. Um, there's a couple of uh, reasons for this. One, um, just because of adding some additional positions uh, that are added into the budget, which we'll talk about later. Um, a contractual change. Currently, our um, contract limits the amount of benefits that uh, first and second year employees can get. So this would um, allow us to eliminate that restriction. That has been a, a problem for us as we are um, trying to recruit employees, particularly when we're looking at um, employees that have been in other districts that may have worked for you know a number of years. They come here and you know they can't afford the cost of paying for the dependent portion of the benefits. So. That would eliminate that um, contractual obligation right now. Um, and then um, just our annual increase, which this year uh, has been estimated to be 10% uh, in our health benefit costs. So if we look at all those things, uh, we add up our support and operational costs again, uh, just about $7 million increase, 5.6%. And the total for fund 11, um, as we know, our general fund is, is fund 10. It's uh, made up of three components, 11, 12, and 13. Fund 11 is our day-to-day -day expenses. And when we look at that increase, it's uh, 11.5 million uh, or a 5.2% increase in, the, in those areas. Moving on to our capital outlay. Capital outlay is fairly small this year, uh, mainly because of the bond referendum. Um, so you can see that in this category, we'll be spending a lot less, um, certainly a lot less in construction projects because most of our projects will be done through the bond, less in equipment, um, and then capital reserve, uh, we won't be doing any projects out of the capital reserve account this year. However, we do have $4 million that would be moved out of the capital reserve account into the debt service account to offset the cost of the bond. And then we have our annual assessment that we get from the state. They give it and then they take it away. Uh, every year we have to pay this assessment back to the state. And this is actually from Rod grants that the district did several years ago. So when we look at that category, we see a fairly significant decrease, um, 3.3 million, about a 30% decrease. And then when we add that to, um, this is fund 12, when we add that to fund 11, we can see that our overall increase is about 8.1 million or 3.5% when we compared the 22-23 to the 23-24 budget. We look at that graphically, it's a little hard to see uh, on the screen, but basically I just took all those categories and broke it down uh, in a graphic presentation. The largest uh, component of our budget is regular education. Special education um, is 11% of our budget. That is the third largest. Um, largest is, 20, is the 29% for regular education. The second largest is employee benefits at 21%. And then we have um, various other categories uh, there that uh, make up the rest of the budget. So if you like a graph, that's, uh, that's how, how we can see that. So if we break it down as we often do, so we can see um, how things changed. We are a personnel-driven organization. And so that means we have 
Salaries and benefits are the largest portion of our budget, about 70% of our budget. Um, and the rest is other. And as we know, because we've talked about it many times, other is everything else that is not salaries and benefits. So that is uh, transportation, utilities, supplies, insurance, uh, legal fees, uh, you know, everything else that doesn't fall into the other category. And then we separated out the capital reserve project piece there. And so again, we can see what the differences are in those particular uh, budget categories. So if we switch over to the revenue side, um, in this budget, we have a 1% increase in the tax levy for the general fund budget, $1.8 million. Uh, we did receive additional state aid, um, $6.7 million in additional state aid this year. Uh, when we met on the 28th, we were not anticipating that increase. Um, so we have an increase there. Um, then we see, as we go down the line, a significant increase in the use of fund balance, uh, almost 30% which, um, you know, you heard Mr. Holt say tonight that as a district, we're in very good financial shape. Um, that level of fund balance, fund balance usage in the buzz budget is concerning to me um, only because once you reach that benchmark, you know, when we go to do our 24, 25 budget, you can't reduce that number. Um, you know, you're looking to probably maintain that level of fund balance in the budget. Um, and so, you know, that's a significant increase. And um, my concern is moving forward, if we don't see the type of increases in state aid that we did this year, um, you know, that, that that will have impact in terms of fund balance because we won't have wiggle room there in terms of being able to throw more at the budget to balance things out. So, um, you know, just to make the board aware that level of fund balance is uncomfortable for me. Um, and then we have here also, which I wanted to touch on briefly because I do think it is a bit confusing for folks. Um, in the 22-23 school year, we have the reserve for encumbrances number. Reserve for encumbrances are purchase orders from the previous school year. So what that means is that at the end of the 21-22 school year, we still had purchase orders for items that we had sent the purchase order out, but we had not received yet. So that moves into the 22-23 budget. And what happens is through the course of the year, we either pay off those, we either receive the items and we pay the invoice or we cancel them, um, depending upon, you know, if something isn't available or what have you. So if you remove that reserve for encumbrances, which is not a revenue source, it is simply a balancing um, reserve uh, because you have your encumbrances in on the appropriation side, you need something to make it balance because unlike the federal government, we need to balance our budget. Um, if you take that piece out, you can see that the difference between the 22-23 and the 23-24 budget is pretty significant. And I think there was some question from the board about how could we receive, you know, $7 million in additional state aid and still need to, you know, consider a tax levy and still use all this fund balance. Well, if you take that number out and you compare the two years, just our increases um, in the budget, just with even before we added any positions were significant. You know, it was $7 million increase between our salaries and benefits. So that's why, you know, a significant amount of that uh, additional state aid really just went to maintain the status quo budget. And then anything additional that we wanna add, uh, the preschool program or some of the positions that we're adding really have to come from other revenue sources. So in this budget, um, that's coming out of uh, the tax uh, increase of 1% and the use of the fund balance. So then again, graphically, if we look at this, we can see that really 16% um, of our budget is coming from state aid and that a significant amount of our budget is coming out of what we call Cherry Hill funds, right? So that's the 77% in the taxes, it's the 1% um, in the miscellaneous revenues and then the use of the fund balance and the capital reserve money is all really Cherry Hill money that's, that's going into our budget. So fairly insignificant portion um, in terms of state aid and federal aid that funds our budget. That being said, we'll always take more state aid and we were very happy to see additional state aid this year. And if you can look at the comparison here from 2019 through 23-24, um, we've had significant increases in our state aid. It has allowed us over the past couple of years to add some additional positions. Um, we did receive almost $7 million more this year. And in addition, um, 
you can see there that we also received debt service aid of almost $7 million. And that was to help fund the payment of the bond principal and interest. So part of the reason we pushed to sell the bonds when we did was because we knew we had a December deadline to submit our information to the state to make sure that we got state aid for this coming year. And so fortunately we got that done in time and you know we can see the benefits of receiving the state aid. They would have given it to us. We wouldn't have lost it. They would have given it to us later, but then it would have created kind of a rolling effect in terms of budget impact. So it was important to get that done when we did. So what's new in this budget? Um, so we have an additional special education class at Beck Middle School, um, and that in, uh, includes uh, one teaching staff member and two educational assistants. It includes an additional ESL teacher, uh, three math coaches, one special education colleague teacher, an additional math and science supervisor, the contractual change in health benefits that I mentioned, and the preschool program from half day to full day. Another component of our budget, you'll see it in the resolution tonight, is the special revenue fund. Uh, we don't know what our grants will be at this point in 23-24. We typically do not find that information out uh, until after the budget process is done. We are required by the county office to budget 85% of what we received in the 22-23 school year. So you can see there that that's pretty much what we did. So I'm not saying that we're going to lose uh, grant funds, but we always budget the minimum until we know exactly what we're getting, um, and those numbers will come at a later date. Um, so the grant funds, uh, this includes federal grants, state grants, uh, local grants. This also includes our student activities and scholarship fund. Uh, we run that now through Fund 20 uh, because of a change in, uh, in the law a couple of years ago. So you can see those. It's not really a decrease. It's just estimates at this point. And then finally, as Mike mentioned tonight, um, we have not had debt uh, since 2018. Um, and so now we're back in the mode of needing to fund our debt service fund. Um, you can see there for next year, our principal payment and interest payment, the first year of the bonds is $22,619. In order to pay for that, we have $4 million coming out of the capital reserve account. We have um, $6.9 million in aid that we receive from the state. And then the tax levy for that is $11,640. And so now debt service, it's not, um, the tax levy to support the debt service fund is not voted on per se because the bond referendum was really the vote on supporting that tax levy, but we always include it in our discussions and in our resolutions so that everyone's aware of what it is and how it impacts taxes. So the tax impact um, with the 1% increase in the budget on the average assessed home of $227,000 is $52.41. The uh, tax impact of the debt service for the bond is $328.68. We had originally estimated that at $399. So we were pleased that um, you know it's lower than what our original estimates were. So next steps, um, so our budget um, gets approved. We submit it to the county for their review. They come back and say, change this, do that, tweak this. Um, typically they don't come back with a whole lot. Um, then we have to advertise it uh, in the paper um, and then we, help, we will hold our public hearing on April 25th. So I just wanna point out um, that um, we do have an opportunity to change the budget between now and then, should we deem that to be um, something that we want to do, um, but we do have to, to meet our March 20th deadline. We do have to make sure that we are submitting something uh, by that date. Okay, are there any questions? So I have a question. So first of all, I just want to say regarding the audit, I know it's super long, but I highly recommend everybody go through it and read it. It was really, really, really informative. And I think it helped me understand the budget and how funds are restricted and unrestricted. And I, I get it, it's long, but I highly recommend it. Um, just read the outlines, like the numbers might not make sense, but like the explanations really do make sense for the most part. Pensions, I didn't get. <laughs> um, oh, that's what, yeah. So can you explain to me the fund balance a little bit better? Is that unrestricted money? 
can that be is I know you said it's kind of like a savings account. Mm -hmm. Um, so can you explain how that is like what has funded the fund balance and then what can that money be used for? So I think the easiest way to explain it, there's, there's different components of fund balance, right? There's some that's restricted. So for instance, in our fund balance, we'll have capital reserve. All right. So that's restricted, right? That can only be used for capital items. We will have excess surplus, which is what Mike talked about tonight, where they do the calculation at the end of the year and they look at what our expenditures were and they, and we're allowed to maintain a percentage of the prior year expenditures. If we're over that, that's called excess surplus, and that has to be used in the following budget year. So that would be restricted. You can have other restrictions. We don't have them for tuition, for maintenance, for those kinds of things. So you have um, free fund balance that you can use. And what that basically means is that at the end of our fiscal year, they close out the revenues and they close out the expenditures and they see what's left. So if you think of your personal budget, you may come to the end of the year and you may say, you know, we had... Um, $50,000 come in and we spent 48,000. So we have $2,000 left over and that can go into your savings or what have you. So it really is just a closing out at the end of the year. Um, and then we have funds left over. Um, you know, sometimes it's because, I mean, typically we do not spend 100% of our budget. We know we'll spend a lot of it, but we don't spend a 100%. Um, sometimes we'll get more revenues than we anticipated and th that'll flow into there as well. When we have fund balance at the end of the year, we have the opportunity to put it into capital reserve. So when we get to the end of this fiscal year in June, you'll see a resolution on the agenda that says we're going to put this much in capital reserve. My preference is always to put as much in the capital reserve as we can, particularly if we are making a commitment um, to spend $4 million each, at least $4 million each year to offset the cost of the debt service. So if we don't put it into fund balance, then we have or into capital reserve. And I want to make one other point about capital reserve before I forget it. Um, you know, then we have that excess, we have that money sitting there that we can use in the budget, you know, to, to kind of balance everything out. The one thing I wanted to point out about, which I didn't, um, about the capital reserve account. So we have the $4 million in there now. Um, that does not include anything for Rod Grant applications. So we're still working on those. I anticipate that for the public hearing, we'll have number, that number will get adjusted. Now that's not going to affect the overall budget, won't affect the tax levy because it comes out of the capital reserve account. So it's an in and an out in the budget. Um, but I just want to point out that, you know, once we come to some consensus about what we're doing with Rod Grant applications, our 60% of the Rod Grant application has to come out of capital reserve. Um, it, that's just the, how the state is, you know, expecting a uh, local share to come from. They're not funding any rod grants with um, bond referendums. So keep in mind that as we talk about preschool expansion or, or what that could look like, if we're going to apply for that rod grant, we have to come up with our 60% to finance that portion. If we do the regular rod grants, which are actually out there right now, there's a $350 million pot of money. As I've said a couple of times during board member meetings, we're looking at things that we cut out of the budget as potential candidates for rod grants. Um, that also has to come out of the capital reserve account. So, so even though we're only, you know, right now spending the 4 million, I anticipate that that number is going to go up. But the answer to your question is basically it's funds that are left over at the end of the fiscal year. Do we invest that money or do, is, are you allowed to? We are limited in what we can invest it in. Right. Um, so right now we we have it invested in some high, higher than normal interest accounts. Okay. We did um, with the bond funds. We did invest them into a, a with a um, company called PFM, and we did open up yep. a capital reserve account as well. And at some point we will transfer funds into that so that once we know how much we're spending and how much we need to have on hand, we'll transfer some funds into that so it can earn interest. And then just one last question. So you like so you showed that the graph that like seventy seven percent of our uh, expenditures or that we use our money is comes from the t the personal tax like the tax levy and sixteen percent is state aid. What is that in comparison to neighboring districts? Do you know? 
I mean, it just depends on the district. Okay. But I mean, is our, do we pay a higher, like, is our, 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 our property taxes a higher percentage versus like a Marlton or a Haddonfield or a, do you know? I don't know. Okay. You know, I, I, I couldn't sure. tell you with any confidence, um, what the difference is. Um, I think taxes are high in New Jersey. They are, <laughs> you know, yeah. um, relatively speaking. Uh huh. Um, so I think that each dis each town, each district, Okay. It's it's going to be different. Okay. It's just going to depend on what their budgets are. Right. You know, and like That's for true. so Marlton is going to have their local school district and then they're going to have Lenape Regional. So they're going to have two school taxes. So it's just different every place. Mrs. Fleischer. First, I wanted to thank you and your staff and all the administration for coming to us with a budget like this. I know there were lots of twists and turns um, along the way and um, a lot of um, figuring things out. So I appreciate it. And I just also appreciate the fact that knowing that we're coming to the table right now with the 1%, which is between zero and two, and we're right in the middle. It's, um, I think, honestly, um, on a, a year that's historic for us of having passed the bond and um, the community putting their trust in us to be fiscally responsible, knowing that they haven't even begun paying for that in their taxes yet. Um, that, But at the same time, we have all sat here and listened to the administration and the teachers and everybody involved to know that there are things that we need to add to our school district to really help our students um, move forward. Um, and I think this is a great start. Um, it's not everything we wanted um, in our wildest dreams, we would hope that we could include everything. But I think this is a great way to sort of put a foot in our dreams and a foot in reality, sort of. Um, you know, I feel that being fiscally responsible um, does not, and, and having wonderful schools do not have to be mutually exclusive. And for me, I think this is a really great start for this to include preschool, to include math coaches, to include you know, we really are excited. I think I've, I've talked to people about, you know, the math and science um, supervisor that we're able to to get somebody back in amongst other things. Um, so I really wanted to thank you for coming to this. I know there were lots of, like I said, twists and turns coming to this, um, but I appreciate all the hard work from Dr. Malash and, and Mrs. Sugar and your team and the whole administrative team for bringing this to the table. Well, you know, I just want to say that, um, I equate putting the budget together sort of like giving birth, like, you know, when it's over and you have a budget, you kind of forget the pain and the stress and the tears. Um, and I don't want to say this year was, was the worst. I would say it's probably in the top five and, you know, I don't fault the, the issue really is getting state aid as late as we did and not having a board meeting in between receiving those numbers and tonight. So, um, you know, I already am strategizing next year, like we're going to have to look at that calendar and we're going to have to build something into it because, you know, trying to get feedback, trying to, you know, work this out um, and put together a budget that that works for everybody was extremely difficult this year. So I, you know, I appreciate your patience as well. Mr. Mayor. I'm going to start by just saying that um, you get the you get the quote of the night with with the birth comment. It, it felt sometimes like it was a, almost like a, a breach birth in the last few days. But um, all kidding aside, um, it wasn't it wasn't easy. Um, a few of us at the table know that um, more specifically. But um, at the end of the day, I, I look at I look at the budget that you put together as as really an achievement budget. Um, it, it, it prioritizes these positions to, to jumpstart achievement at every level. Um, pre-K in particular does that. And also, um, the, the, the ability now to attract and retain talented teachers, which I mean, we, we've, we've, that's been a struggle for too long, not just here, but everywhere. Um, and, 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 and you've, you've, um, produced a budget that allows us to do that and allows the community to see those impacts um, with a total per household impact, including the bond uh, impact at less than what was uh, modeled at the time that the bond was approved by uh, unanimous numbers. So 
um, it's not a zero sum game, um, as Mrs. Fleischer said. Um, it, it really can be, you can have not at all, but almost. Um, so I think you, you did an amazing job under difficult circumstances. Um, the state didn't help. Some of the questions coming in late didn't help, but here we are. So um, that's a very long winded thank you. Um, I know the budget thing you did an excellent job, even though I couldn't comprehend all of them. I went through a lot of time. I still couldn't get off many years. Uh, Kim, thanks for that. <laughs> I'm like, okay, I did try to read most of it. Um, I just want to find out uh, on the budget, right? Is the um, does it include any security cameras in our school district to keep the school safe, or any of the things that we? Well, we have um, we have security cameras throughout the district. Um, that's one of the things that um, you know, will be added as we add additional spaces um, through the bond. So, adding additional security cameras will come through the bond, not through the budget. Oh, that's okay. And that's it. Uh, also the stadium, I assume. That's the, putting security cam to the stadium as well? Um, at West Stadium, I'm not sure. I, I'd have to I, I guess that. whatever stadium that doesn't have cameras. Neither of them do it right now. <laughs> then we need, yeah, I assume we would like to have school safety, so I think that would be a great idea is to put it in if we have the budget. Or even if we don't have the budget, we have to find a way how to do that. Well, I'll, try, I'll you know, I know that there's improvements that are being done at East, and I know that there will be um, lights put in and speakers put in. Uh, I'm not sure that cameras are on that list, um, but we can certainly take a look at that. But no, there's no money in the budget for that right now. Oh, thank you for that. And I, I think this, um, I can talk about the other thing later, but thank you. Mrs. Stratton. Thank you so much. Um, I hope you get some sleep and your whole team gets to rest now. Take a little breath, um, just because I, I know this is stressful. But I, you know, as as us as a team, this is I love this presentation because to go back to when I'm sitting here screaming, we operating like a five million dollar organization, but we're not. We this is the proof of it, and you know, I I can't say enough how like I'm I'm worried that we we. We, I know we don't want to put too much on our residents, obviously, me being one of them, right? Um, Lord knows I can't afford it, but it's at the cost, or I don't want it to be at the detriment of our students because, you know, it makes these conversations null and void when we don't want to put our money where our mouth is. So I appreciate you um, at least getting us halfway there. My question is kind of really for Mrs. Adrian. Um, because I know I see it, but I'm like, um, I'm, you know, I want to make sure I'm not dreaming this. We're really getting this budget puts in what we need. We discussed in HR about the benefit side of it. We, we'd be good to go. Okay. And not that I didn't trust you, but I needed to make sure. <laughs> I needed to make sure. Um, so that really sets up the next HR director as well in terms of recruitment. Um, so uh, thank you to Ms. Adrian for, for being very vocal about what we need there so we can get some new talent here. But um, but yeah, other than that, I, I don't have any other questions. I just want to make sure we were good for HR. Dr. Rude. Um, first of all, I think the, the Oscar should really go to Lynn Sugars. <laughs> But thank you very much. Um, and congrats on the awesome, like the with the auditor giving kudos, way to go. Um, so my fund balance or savings account is like $25. So I love seeing $10 million, but you didn't seem happy with that number. What's a good number? Um, I would I would be more comfortable if it was in the eight, eight and a half range. Okay. And why does why does that make a difference? I don't really understand that. Because my concern is um, that you set once you set the benchmark. So if you took um, ten dollars out of your personal budget every year to balance your budget, you have to it, you use at least ten dollars every year. So by setting the number at that threshold, right. we're at that threshold now, okay. moving forward, because we're not going to find three million dollars or two million dollars someplace else to gotcha. reduce that number. Okay, thanks, Mrs. Winters. Thank you. I just want to thank you for the clarity of your explanation tonight. Suddenly it all made sense. Um, 
as many of the board members know, I put in probably too many hours more than I would like to admit this weekend trying to understand everything. And I just really appreciate you for the um, the way that you methodically went through and clearly explained it all because now I understand so much more than I did before. So thank you for that. Um, I just also want to, as um, chair of CNI, say how thankful I am to my fellow board members because I think we all really tried to listen to what was being told to us. We asked the administration um, to tell us what they thought that the priorities were, and I think we tried to listen well. And I'm glad that, you know, it it was tough to talk about because nobody, you know, like Jen said, like Ms. Fleischer said, you know, we would love the dream budget where we can do everything all at once, um, but we have to live in reality. So I just want to thank my fellow board members for talking it through um, with me and trying to listen hard. And I think we got to a place that we're all comfortable with. And so just thank you, everybody, for your hard work. Thank you, Ms. Sugars, your team, the whole administration for their hard work. Um, we really do appreciate it. Hi. So um, I'm, I'm a big proponent of, of school funding, and I'm, I'm glad I got to be a part of this process. It's been a, a very long couple of days, and I, I appreciate your responses to my many, many questions. Um, decreased state funding really helped meet a lot of our needs. That was a pleasant surprise. Um, and like many of us, I, I thought we still needed to take that into consideration before asking for additional funding for the community. Um, you know, going down to 0%, we don't get anything on our wish list. And there, there were a lot of very important things here. Uh, I think reducing this to 1% was a great compromise. We're able to save uh, our residents some money, still being able to do great things with it. Uh, I'm really excited for uh, a lot of the things in this. Uh, you know, Jen went through most of the list, but uh, a math and science coordinator, math coaches, additional special education teachers and assistants. Uh, I'm, I'm excited about preschool expansion. I think we're gonna do big things with that. Um, and and so much more. Uh, but I, I definitely want to thank you, Ms. Uh, Ms. Sugars and, and Dr. Malosh uh, and fellow board members for all the hours that, uh, that went into this. Uh, I think uh, we're in a good place and I know we have more work to do uh, and I look forward to, you know, to delivering for our students. So thank you. You're welcome. I, I mean, I really need to tell you that it, it, it's not just me and Dr. Malasha, though. It was a lot of me and Dr. Malasha the past couple of days, but the budget process literally starts in October and is from the ground up. And, you know, it, it hits every department and every school and every principal. Um, so it's it's really, um, it's a huge team effort um, to put the budget together. So it's lots and lots of people are involved with that. Yep. And thank you. Thank you to everybody who, who worked on this. Very big undertaking. Thank you. Sure. Um, so I, I definitely want to echo what a lot of people have been saying. Um, you know, I think we can all calmly talk and politely together about this budget, um, but that really doesn't reflect the the this, the real intense conversations that happened um, in in a lot of directions um, about how do we balance the different pieces that that we all have to think about that the board specifically has to think about right um and it was hard it was really tough um and you know mrs sugars um you know you're always extremely composed you know and i think there was this little moment of like ah! <laughs> the other day so i just really um you know i really want to acknowledge the real piece of this which is just this is really tough um and and you saying this is one of your hard you know in, in your top number of difficult times. I mean, I, I can appreciate that. And, um, and I know Dr. Malash, you know, same thing, you know, yeah, um, <laughs> you're smiling and we will smile together, but it was tough. Um, and, and, you know, and I, I, I mean, I definitely appreciate um, the willingness to have those difficult, you know, challenging conversations back and forth about how do we figure this all out and, and kind of sometimes be on different sides of, you know, what are the right priorities, you know, with you as the educational experts and us as the board with, you know, sometimes different charges in some ways. And I think that, um, I also just acknowledge, I think that's a pretty, I mean, I've been, this is my, in my third year on the, come into my third part of my term of the board, third year. I mean, it's a different, I was never involved to this degree in those conversations. So it's, uh, it's definitely, I rec I just have to continue to acknowledge how different the experience has got to be for you all and for your team 
team over there um, and all the people who are standing behind you who are not actually here tonight. So, um, so just a, a true thank you, you know, genuine appreciation for the ability to sort this out um, and, um, and to support the commitment. And this is current board and to you guys, the previous board, which I was also on from last year, wanted to maintain the commitment of putting capital reserves to pay down the bond debt. But we also knew you can't promise what the next board's going to do. And it's such a, a great relief to me that we have been able to fulfill that commitment this year. Um, so that that feels great. I think, um, you know, I think when the state aid numbers came out, it was like, wow, it's a whole lot of money. And it really is. But like, we have a whole lot of increased costs, too. And, you know, we're kind of getting our feet under us as a district after, you know, years and years of underfunding and years and years and years of like having to do without, having to do without. I mean, you know, we, you, we've got a comparison. I, I think it was Dr. Mahan sent it to us of like, you know, other districts, how many math and science supervisors they have compared to, you know, we have one and we have 19 schools and we're the 12th largest, I think currently the 12th largest district in the state. I mean, just, an, you know, trying to get us back on track on every area, our buildings, our, our curriculum, um, you know, and not curriculum, but our staffing to support the curriculum. It just, there's just, it's a lot that goes into it. So, so there's just acknowledgement of the difficulty of, of the, you know, the different challenges. Um, you know, I, I really just fundamentally also want to say, I, feel a great sense of relief of all the things, specifically including preschool, specifically including meeting the special ed needs that are that do in budget wise do increase the services do we're putting more classrooms in. That's it's also a commitment from the, you know, commitment that the community has asked that we, you know, we're trying to meet these commitments or at least these asks. Um, and ultimately we're still below our, our the ultimate we're we're the total amount of tax increase that our taxpayers will feel is still overall less than the original amount that we that we that was calculated that was part of the bond vote. The bond vote said there was going to be three hundred ninety nine dollar a year to the average assessed home. We're closer to three eighty, which it's not a huge amount of money, but for all that we're getting, preschool included, that's just that's just mind blowing to me. And I mean, thank goodness we got the state aid. It's a huge kudos to being, you know, recognized that we needed it. So all that to say, <laughs> thank you. I'm very, I feel very strongly that this is a really good step. We, this is the right budget. And I definitely feel good about supporting it. So that's it. I have a question just for the uh, BNF committee. Um, so now that we're, Ms. Sugars presented this and she gave us a timeline and the next steps and all, I just, are, are we having any conversations in that committee about, um, I'm sure Ms. Sugars forecasts all the time, but forecasting, you know, where we're going to have to go because just having sat on this board for a few years, we've been staying at zero, staying at a half, staying at one, you know, which is amazing to do, but you know, at some point we're going to, we're going to feel it and we're going to need to, to get up there. And I don't want people to, to, to think that we're not prepared for that or, or to think that we'll never go to that 2% because it, it might be necessary in a, in one year or two years or three years. And everybody should like get comfortable being uncomfortable because it's just going to happen. Um, and, and we've been blessed that this administration has been making do with a half or one or or whatnot, but at some point, are we thinking like eventually we're gonna have to go to the two? Like it's it, it, it's 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 a possibility. I just don't want. I guess I, I I you know I don't want the community to think that um we're always gonna be able to maintain this because it's not. It's for me. I don't think that that's that's a fair thing to even foreshadow. I think that we have a blessing this year, and we're able to do what we can, but that blessing is is not going to overflow all the time. So I don't know. I, I just I just want us to be cautious and aware of, of that, is that we're going to have more needs and it's going to increase in other areas. Things like, you know, SAC needs to be charged. Like there's things that have to increase with the times. And so I don't know. That's just 
I didn't know if that's also part of the conversations in BNF as we go forward. Well, you know, I'll say this. Um, it's certainly realistic. Those are those are realistic concerns. Um, specific conversations as to, you know, will we have to go to 2% next year or in 26? That level of, of, um, of detail would be um, inappropriate just because we don't know. But not knowing doesn't mean we're not aware that it might be uh, it might be required. Um, I don't know, if, Mrs. Sugars, if you have any, you want to add any, you know, additional details on that. But I mean, th that's, I think it goes without saying um, that just because the district has been able to um, get by um, with less over the last few years um, and is, is going to be able to do much more than just get by this year with still significantly less than 2%, doesn't mean that that's always going to be the case. I mean, I certainly recognize that, and I think I think the rest of us do as well. Yeah, I think my biggest concern is, um, you know, what is state aid going to look like moving forward? We've already gotten more than we thought we would. Um, do I anticipate that each year we're going to get $7 million additional state aid? I do not. I mean, I didn't think we were going to get it this year. So um, my concern um, is, you know, what does state aid look like moving forward? Um, you know, as we implement programs, additional programs, I, I honestly do worry about, you know, is as we talked about tonight, if there's a change in governor, if there's whatever, you know, are we gonna be able to maintain those programs moving forward? Um, so I, I do um, I am concerned about some of those things. Mrs. Fleischer. Um, two quick things. One is, um, I have to just say, I'm not, um, I'm not against going to 2% at some point, to be honest. It's not against my grain, you know, philosophically. I, I, I think just for this year, this is where my head was, but in general, I, I think that, um, it's not something that I would be pushing against all the time. So it's not something that I'm taking a strong stance on going forward. Um, but my question actually is for Mrs. Um, Sugar's we have craziness going on in the financial markets right now, a lot to do with bonds specifically. Um, so I was thinking about it and being on BNF last year, and I'm remembering going through this, I'm forgetting all the details. Um, if the bond rates can, you know, if our bond rates work in our best interest, are we able to refinance anything yet? Is there, I forget the timing of everything and, and what type of thing happening would, you know, how would that help us in the timing? I don't really call the timeline, but I can tell you that the balls, the bonds are callable. Um, so yes, at some point we can refinance them if we see that, um, you know, there's there's uh, an advantage to doing that. Um, I I want to say it's like eight years, but I'm not sure. Um, but yes, we absolutely can do that if, if at some point it looks like that would be advantageous. And we have our, you know, financial advisors, the bond like advisors that would just help, um, you know, let us be aware since the bond is so big, it might be to our advantage, but I know it takes a lot to do that. It does. And and they absolutely monitor that. Um, and yes, if, if there's an opportunity to do it, they'll make sure we know about it. Great. Thanks. <laughs> any other board members have any questions? Seeing none. Um, that's it. Thank you. Okay. So we now go on to HR, which will be the shortest discussion, <laughs> the shortest report out of the night. Go for it, Mrs. Uh, Ms. Alma Stratton. So um, I, <laughs> I actually was out for committee last week. So um, I want to thank Ms. Fleischer for stepping in for me um, with the committee. And uh, we don't have much to report that we can report. I'm going to look over to Ms. Adrian and, and again to Ms. Fleischer. Is there anything that can be shared out from that meeting um, publicly to, to share with the fellow board members. Um, job descriptions for the administrative positions in the district are being run through the um, March agenda cycle just for equity and ADA compliance language. It's the only changes. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and we consistently get to see that when in the HR committee go through. Did you wanna, any? 
<laughs> this is weird. Any committee member want to add and say anything else? <laughs> um, I think also they were talking about um, teacher transfer timeline is coming up. Um, that, and that, that's about it. Awesome. Okay. So that is pretty much our committee report out. Thank you so much, Mr. Mayor, Ms. Stern. Okay. So now we move on to policy and legislation. And Mrs. Fleischer, if you could please give us a report out. Great, thank you. Um, we had our meeting and um, I thank Mrs. Weathington for all the work that she's done and our committee members for all the insightful um, discussion that we had. A lot of it was discussion. We have no first policy readings um, this month. Um, so a lot of the discussion is something that will be ongoing. Um, our next committee meetings are actually the Committee of the Whole in April. So all of you will be part of you know, our committee meetings. Um, and the first one of the, uh, well, the first thing that Mrs. Weathington did was she gave us a legislative update, which she has been doing that our legislative um, possible legislative updates that could affect our district. So we appreciate the fact that she does the research to bring that to us each month. Um, and um, the second one was policy 5770, the student right of privacy update. Um, this is something that we're going to be discussing um, more in depth at the, um, at the next committee meeting on April 11th. Um, and this is something that actually Mr. Green had brought up, wanting to um, change the wording in the policy. Um, it's a proposed revision to the policy. And we had a discussion, and it has to do with, um, Mrs. Weathington, do you mind giving us a, like a little bit of update about how, <laughs> you're passing one, the one microphone back and forth, um, how, um, and or, you know, Mr. Green is going to be part of our discussion for next time. Uh, and but it, can you give some background to why it was brought to our committee? 5770? Yes, 5770. So we were having a conversation about the policy not related to um, changes, and Mr. Green made an observation about the language. Dr. Malash and I talked to uh, the high school principals just to get a background on how frequently that provision had been used. It had not been used in any of their tenure in the role. And uh, Mr. Green suggested that we eliminate that language. Modify, he said. I'm, I'm sorry, <laughs> modify. I misquoted. To modify it, it has to do um, with some of the parent, the parent involvement um, with with um, with that policy. Um, so what we will do is I'll send it out because if anyone has any questions about this policy and has any questions to, uh, for Mr. Green, we're actually taking it from the committee members, um, any specific questions that we want him to discuss at the next meeting. But like I said, it's committee of the whole. So it's gonna be with all of us having that, um, the questions, but we'll um, forward the questions to you through Mrs. Weathington um, specifically if there's any other questions. Um, the next one on the agenda is Regulation 5350, which was formerly the S-12, um, and that was also brought up um, for the S-12 is actually a regulation. It is not um, a policy, so it's something that eventually, if there's any changes to it, um, it well, there are going to be some changes to it. They don't have to be actually brought through the policy procedure of the first reading, second reading, et cetera, um, but something that we would want um, our committee and the board to understand and be in favor of. Um, Mrs. Weathington, can you give the brief update on what the changes we have talked about? We're going to add a provision to include the waiver going up to grades five. We've already added the provision of insight, which if you remember, you approved that in January. That's the ability to clear students while they're in school, if the parents opt for that choice, or to provide virtual clearance in their home. Uh, so we've added that as a provision, and we've cleaned up some of the language, and we've updated the forms. Great, thank you. Um, so just to give a little bit more clarity even to what Mrs. Weathington was saying, because I think this is great when it comes to this. Um, something that was brought up, I wanna say it was last year, um, Mrs. Stern had brought this up about the waiver. When a child is from, when a child is, we're talking about elementary school, from pre-K to two, when a child um, either comes up with a wording that either hurts himself or um, or someone else, and they're seen at, they, they have the flexibility to look at it through the lens of um, the principal and the administration in the school itself, um, seeing that they are able to deem one waiver one time for that child um, so that the child does not have to be per se sent out 
um, even though younger kids aren't, you know, sent out, but um, they have the one waiver and it goes from kindergarten to um, third grade, they have the one waiver. Um, now what we're proposing is to extend it um, to fourth and fifth grade um, so that you have the one waiver before needing to be sent out or needing actually to be seen um, as an intervention to um, and being okay to be let back in school. Um, that goes hand in hand actually with Insight, what Mrs. Wethington had said. Um, Insight has been a great addition, I think, and I think our, our um, committee would say the same thing. We had a great discussion about it. Insight is actually a crisis management um, center that actually will come in to the school um, there's actually four different ways that they can be used, which I find is very, very helpful for the parents, because this is something that we've heard from our community. And I think it's a way our district is answering their call for other alternatives. Um, so what would happen is if a child for school, like any grade from K to 12, has an issue where they have said something that they're going to hurt themselves or hurt someone else, and they're um, brought into guidance counselors, um, and they're deemed that um, they need to have, um, they need to be looked at or need to have some type of meeting um, or intervention to be allowed back into school. Insight comes in as the provider. Before students would be automatically sent out, the parents would have to find a place. Um, it could be, you know, Jefferson, it was Jefferson Kennedy um, or another private provider that would have to be, um, you know, actually look after them and then talk to the school and uh, give them the clearance to come back in. Now with Insight, there's four different ways that our parents can actually um, be helped by Insight. Number one, the parent can come in, take the child home, um, visit Insight and Cherry Hill themselves. Um, the second way is that the parent could come in, take the child home, go to a private provider and get clearance. Um, the other two ways actually are very ingenious and I think very helpful is that the child can stay in school. The parent always has to be involved with insight. They will not do anything without a parent, parent involvement. Um, the parent can either come to the school and um, they can Zoom or um, meet with uh, insight at the school or the parent, if the parent is not able to come to the school, the child stays in the school Insight and the parent both zoom in while the administration, like the, the guidance counselor and or the principal would be there and talk about the clearance. Um, I think it just gives so many more options and expedites the process and it's not so traumatic for the children either. So I think um, that has been a great, great addition to our um, to our district. And I wanna thank you know our, our administration for really bringing that in because I think it's wonderful. Um, so that was the biggest updates about S-12. And I think they're really positive. Um, the next thing that we had, well, does anyone have anything else to say about for our committee? <laughs> okay. Um, the next thing were the new Strauss ESME policy revisions. Um, so a lot of these revisions went through BNF and CNI. Um, we had policy 5200. That was um, through us of its attendance. That was approved already for first reading in February 2023. Same with policy 8140, student enrollment, enrollment and counting. Um, policy 8330, student records, approved for first reading. Um, policy 0152, board officers, approved for first reading in BNF. Um, policy 0161, call adjournment and cancellation, approved for first reading in BNF. Policy 0162, notice of board meetings, approved for first reading in BNF. And then policy 2423, bilingual and ESL education, approved for first reading in CNI. Um, the next uh, old business we talked about was class size. Um, there was, again, a discussion. This is policy and regulation 2312. Um, Mrs. Wellington, do you mind giving an update about that with the waiver we were talking about, too? Sure. Uh, so currently the class size regulation is where we uh, outline the number of students at elementary level only because there's no class size secondary level in each grade level. There's specific numbers K1, 2, 3, 4, 5. We proposed um, doing a waiver um, 
of the regulation. It would go through Dr. Malash. We would waive one student per section. So that, let me just clarify what that means. If it were Barton, for example, and they had three sections of first grade, we would permit one waiver per section. So a total of one in each class in that grade. Um, Mr. Greenbaum asked me to go back. We talked about forced enrollment. We currently forced enroll 87 students in the district. Uh, he asked me to look at, um, and actually Ms. Gallagher asked me to look, I think it was the two of you, um, and apply that and see what the number looks like. And applying the waiver to the current students who are forced to enroll, we were able to reduce that number from 87 to 63. Uh, to a transportation savings, we currently spend about 380000 to transport those, those children, and we saved um, 280000 The cost would then be 100000 Ms. Spellington, I think you're reduced by 63. I'm sorry, did I say add? No, you said you went from 87 to 63. I'm sorry, 87 to 20, 23, reduced by 64. Thank you, Dr. Malash. What time is it? 1029. It's Okay. <laughs> Uh, so I think Mrs. Fleischer, did I cover everything that we talked about? I think you did. One of the issues um, that the committee brought up is just making sure that the teachers were aware and um, and you had said that correct you with board support. I'll now move on to Mr. Redfern and have that conversation. He's in the back. <laughs> um, so <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> at ten thirty tonight we'll have that discussion. Um, thank you, Mrs. Wellington. Um, the last um, thing we spoke about is policy eight one one zero, the attendance area. So area, just the update on the middle school survey. Sure. So uh, we had a possible one. Let me just circle back. I apologize. I start in the middle. If you recall, we surveyed sixth and seventh grade parents and gave them the option of remaining in their current school or transferring, quote, unquote, to their new district school. We had 1,625 possible parents who would be families who'd be impacted. We heard from 1,288 families. Of that number, we had 24 requests for transfers. Of that number, seven were parents who just were unclear about the survey. So we asked the buildings to go back and work with them just to help them understand. Uh, three additional parents were parents of students with IEPs, and that's guided by the IEP process. So the case manager reached out to all those, those families to let them know. They would discuss it during the IEP, IEP process. That left 14 remaining transfers that have already been processed, and we had requests um, for all three schools. Great, thank you, Mrs. Wellington. Does anyone from our from the committee have any additional comments or questions? Anyone from the board? Any additional comments or questions? No, uh, Mrs. Stern. Okay, so I know it's been a long meeting. A um, couple things. Just I want to thank um, Mrs. Wellington and your team because I think you know looking to how do we in a very low impact way in terms of, you know, our students in the classroom also be mindful of how can we make a better experience for families. And also, by the way, be fiscally good, fiscally good stewards of the budget. You know, you know, the, I think this policy really gets there and it hits a lot of notes. So thank you. And um also just want to thank, um, you know, I think the S12, the, regarding the S12 procedure, I just, um, I was lucky enough to sit on the committee where it was talked about, and that was, um, you know, the input from the staff who are charged with implementing the S-12 procedure, which they they rigorously do whenever there is a concern of safety for a student, for their own safety towards themselves or or someone else, a risk issue. Um, the Actually, I think every staff member in the building gets goes through training on, on identifying that and addressing that if I if I got that if I understood that correctly from the mental health task force. So there's a very rigorous process for it. And I think there was a need to, to there's sometimes the situations, um, both because of legislative changes or regulatory changes, and also because of input from the staff about a time for some flexibility when it's when there's not a risk issue you know, to give a little more flexibility. Um, I think that's a good improvement. And then I think finally, um, uh, Mrs. Wellington, Ms. Mallory, and Dr. Malosh, um, finding that resource of insight, behavioral health, it's really, it's a game changer because for years and years and years, parents have said, 
I now am asked to take my child out of school and go get them looked at, you know, looked at, and it's hard to find a place to go and they can wait for hours in the emergency room. And instead of having that, they can just get in a proper evaluation at, in a much more accessible, affordable, convenient way that is much less disruptive to the students. So I, 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 I mean, it was fat. Like when you told me about it, Mrs. Weicher, I was like, oh my gosh, it's a major game changer. So really so appreciative of that, of that resource that's now in place. I think it's um, just, again, you know, uh, always looking for better resources for our students and really trying to do the best for them while balancing out the need to ensure that we, if we have a kid who's at risk, that we're, we're, we're on it. So. Thank you, Mrs. Stern. And I was remiss to not thank Mrs. Um, Mallory, Ms. Mallory, for um, bringing that to our attention. And thanks again to Mrs. Wellington. Um, I'm all set. Thank you so much, Mrs. Stern. Okay. All right. Now we move on to our special action. I'm sorry, strategic planning. Dr. Rood, I almost, almost went right past that. I'm so sorry. Dr. Rood, uh, if you could please give the um, strategic planning report. A good thing you tried to skip me because I see this going to midnight and I'm going to help me get there. <laughs> All right, I'll I'll try to be quick. So the so the first thing I want I want to say about strategic planning when I report out on this stuff, the like we don't we aren't like the other committees where we have kind of a well baked uh, agenda where we're making real hard decisions. We're trying to think about some of the bigger issues, and that means it's a little bit softer and a little bit harder to pin down. And for people reading the committee notes later on just know that these are just notes about conversations that they're not they're not set in stone they're not things that we're about to change policy um, a good example is i said something about well probably in the future we'll need more buildings or we'll need you know for whether it's preschool or if enrollment goes up and at a meeting a couple like at a in public comment a week or two later um somebody said well dr rude said that we're gonna we need a new building that's strategic planning. We're just thinking about stuff. We're trying to bake ideas. And then I talk about them to, to the rest of the board members in this report out. And the idea is for us to just have a, a safe space to kind of think about hard issues. And then I can mention them here. And then, and then we can think, well, do these things, are they at a place where they're ready for other committees to think about, or should we talk about it a little bit more? And most of the stuff that I'm going to report out tonight is stuff that is no, it's, it's it's conversations we're still having, like we're not ready to talk overly serious about action items per se. Um, so with so with that said, I just think that's really important both for the non-committee members but also for the public to kind of understand. Um, but in, so in terms of uh, report out for our committee, um, I gave a very brief sustainability update. Um, Dr. Al Morales from Rosa Middle School has been named the interim chair of the committee. That may or may not change going forward. I think at the next commit, uh, committee meeting, which is March 20th, um, there's going to be a more formal discussion about uh, structure of the committee and also a discussion about the mission statement, which is the next thing that they're planning to bring to us um, to, to review. Um, after the mission statements, all, all kind of set and we're happy with that. They'll move on to the creating a sustainability plan. There's two things we should really have on our radar for that. One is the to, to join with Sustainable New Jersey, which is kind of the state run, it's kind of what everybody kind of goes to for sustainability in New Jersey in terms of schools. There's two things that are really important. One is to engage with them. We will have to pass a resolution um, saying that we're going to, to work with them. So that's something that, you know, maybe I'll eventually, I'll get my day in the, in the sun to uh, have an action item to put forth in the agenda for strategic planning um, so that so we'll have to pass a resolution at some point if we will if the if the committee suggests that and we choose to do it and one of the few so sustainable jersey doesn't have a lot of required things that you do but there is one and that's that schools have green teams and so that'll be a big part of any sustainability plan that involves sustainable new jersey and i think um uh, it'd be 
it'd be awesome if all of our teachers were still here because it, you know, it'd be lovely to give, you know, hopefully the, uh, I, I can't wait to see what teachers and admin and people in individual buildings come up with to um, institute green teams and to get kids engaged and to um, kind of create that buy-in for the sustainability committee and sustainability plan and, and bringing a little, some, uh, really, I think, wonderful changes to the schools. So so those are two big things that'll come up um, in the not-too-distant future with sustainability. Uh, fair funding, I gave a brief uh, update because um, I had attended the last fair funding meeting. Not, not a lot of new info. The fair funding meeting largely rehashed uh, the, the um, our last committee meeting back in February where uh, the the Fair Funding Committee Chair gave a report out to us um, in that committee meeting, and I already reported on that here. Um, bottom line is um, in the is what you saw in the budget. We got an extra seven million dollars this year, or just under seven million. So uh, shout out to Fair Funding for their hard work. Um, and in their meeting, they talked about like what do they do next, and kind of the big thing is is keep up the fight because I, I think. Um, uh, I couldn't say it any better than our audit, the auditor who said it's not fair. It's still not fair. We might be hitting the whatever the calculated formula is at this point, but it's it's the number. Like I think this is a conversation we'll have again in in strategic planning. It's still not high enough. It's it's not anywhere near. It's not. <laughs> in line. I'm thinking of like actual plot lines that I've been looking at. So I need to make some plots to bring to like strategic planning, but Cherry Hill's not anywhere on that best fit line with other school districts. Um, so uh, we need, we still deserve more. Um, and so fair funding, I think still has a lot of fight left to give. Um, so that's pretty much it for that. And then the main discussion that we had and um, and I'm going to cut this a little short because it is late, um, was about communication. Um, so a couple of board members have given me kind of some talking points they were interested in bringing up for discussion about communication. So we, um, we started off with a brief discussion about should we stream, uh, um, should we stream the committee meetings? Um, that was a suggestion um, from the um, from Kim Gallagher. Um, it's a great suggestion. What we talked about in the meeting is that, first of all, a lot of districts don't even offer access to committee meetings because it's not a quorum. It's not a public meeting. It's a work meeting. Um, and part of, I'm a, sh I'm, a, <laughs> I'm a shy person, so I'm always like no cameras, but, but part of the conversation was really more about like you put that camera on and all of a sudden everybody's afraid to say what what they want because it's now recorded and you know forever and you know sound bites get misused and whatever. So there's some I, I think the the general feeling among the committee and among it, the admin that were there is that that's probably not we understand the desire for transparency, but it's probably not the best idea. Um and but I wanted to make sure it got its fair uh like that it was mentioned amongst the board so that we can talk about it amongst ourselves in a wider conversation now and and think about it seriously. I don't think we should have that discussion tonight, but now that now that it's on the on the table, you know, let's share ideas, let's bring it back to strategic planning and talk about it again. Um, the other two, we talked about a few other things. We talked about HIB and uh, and and kind of the broader topic of student conduct and um, you know, it, HI, the, these are some sensitive, very sensitive issues. Um, HIB, a lot of times people don't, including board members, have a hard time understanding what the statute is, the state statute. So HIB is not something we do necessarily because, you know, we, as, as a school district, we're trying to uh, take care of bullying. That's more in our student conduct. conduct. HIB is a state statute that we're required to to do a report, a whole reporting on certain uh, certain types of uh, harassment, intimidation, and bullying, and and it, it's 
more complicated than just those words. If you just say harassment, intimidation, and bullying, everybody has a concept of what those words are. The statute is not going to make you happy with your definitions. Um, so that's something we talked about a little bit. It's something that um, we've had we've had educational meetings for the board on, um, you know, uh, uh, and and what we what we talked about that I think is probably the most salient suggestion or idea is that we try to find a way to provide information when a HIB is is given. We can we can give parents information at the beginning of the year, but um, not everybody reads it. Um, probably not many read it, but it's really the time where you are, you know, at the time that the the a HIB occurs, like that's when people are most in need of salient information and and that's when they're most confused and most scared and most upset and is there a way that we can uh improve communication surrounding that process um no decisions were made this is not like i said this is just a conversation um and it's it's a conversation that will continue we also talked about you know uh so what what happens when you feel like you're being bullied and it's not a hib, you know? That's a very hard topic for us to deal with because, you know, kids are kids can be pretty good at hiding their bad behavior from adults. Um sometimes it's very subtle bullying that is persistent and causes real trauma to the victim. And and how do we how do we address that? How do we deal with that? Um you know, so finding you know, so what so some of the things we talked about are there better ways of, you know, communicating to parents about, you know, what was what was done for a child that was a victim or talking to the parents of an offender about about student conduct conduct, you know, like are there are there things that we can tweak? We did not go very deep into that conversation, but I I'm just putting it out there so that you can all now think, you know, about those ideas. Let them let them, you know, uh Thank you, percolate. That's a good term. Marinate. Uh, marinate, whatever you want, and you know, bring back your best ideas. You know, uh, and it, you know, and chances are the districts thought of it. It's a hard, it's a really hard topic, but it's it's something that there's definitely you can see the pain out in the community sometimes. You know, at these meetings, and and we want to we want students to feel safe in their environment, and sometimes that's really hard hard to do because it can be a hard thing to to see um we also talked about like uh this goes along with mental health but like our and you know, and kind of kind of counseling and care are that you know are we you know is, is there more that we can do to offer up like information about about for parents like we can send a kid to a counselor that's great but can we help parents to know how give them tools give them you know, a pamphlet on like, you know, resiliency and can we, you know, can we help parents to help the their kids with those issues because parents don't always know how to be resilient. I mean, I I have an anxiety disorder and there's times like I don't want to get out of bed and and I it's hard, very hard for me to be there for my kids when they're having trouble, you know, so it it it's a tough thing out there. What can we do to help parents a little bit more? Um, and, you know, so can, you know, we as the board soak up, you know, comments from outside and bring things back to the district. Like I said, they have thought about so so many of these issues for so long, you know, but it, hopefully, you know, any little thing we can do, any suggestion we can make that they haven't thought of that we can help with, I think is important. And so that was a, that was the largest part of what we discussed in terms of this effort to talk about communication um, within the district. We also talked briefly about social media and should we as a board have a heavier social media presence. Um, Barbara Wilson uh, pretty clearly uh, suggested that we be very careful in thinking about having a board social media account just because some of the dangers of social media and how some of the conversations really get away from you um it it can be real hard to to get your messaging right in social media because 
you know, how many people have offended somebody with a, with a text because you lose context. Um, uh, so really talking to us um, <laughs> in person is probably a better way uh, than us having our own social media account. And um, maybe if the board has more things that they want to communicate out, probably partnering with the district through in their social media or something would probably be a better way to go. Um, and again, not something we, that was decided, just something that, you know, just ideas that are percolating and we will have more discussions. We didn't finish our discussion about communication um, as strategic planning, so that will continue. Um, those are the, those, so those are the highlights. Um, like I said, we don't have a strict agenda. If you guys have things that are really, um, uh, really like weighing down on you and you don't have a good place or know where to talk about them, um, it, but you want them kind of brought up at a meeting, tell me, I'll bring them up at strategic planning and then I'll feel like I have to report out on it and it'll get out to the whole wider meeting. Um, and uh, that's it. Any any questions or, sorry. Yeah, some more Stratton. Thank you, Dr. Root. Um, I, I hate that your committee seems like a hodgepodge of all the things that <laughs> don't fit anywhere. But I love that your committee has taken time to uh, really form and be intentional about the conversation so that the hodgepodge has a point and it's not just all over the place. Um, I, I definitely love that you, you're you tackling communication. I think that's something that's uh, really on the forefront of everybody's mind. And um, I would love to hear what your committee comes up with in terms of how we can move the needle there in terms of combating um, not stopping because that's not possible, but combating some of the false information that gets out there and gets told over and over and over and over again. Um, I, I've always thought uh, our board chair would be great once a quarter to be in a malosh minute and maybe that might help. Um, so I don't know. But um, my other thing, the other thought is with along with the um, with HIV in terms of how to better explain it. I do like the comments that you guys have here um, pertaining to just notifications. And, but I just also want to caution us too that there's, you know, 10,000 students, but there's very small percentage that are, you know, reporting HIV or um, incurring that. I don't want us to have such a hard focus on it. This is going to sound horrible at 11 o'clock at night, but I don't want us to have such a hard focus on it so that we're developing more. Um, layers and layers of policy and procedures on it um, because there's such a large amount of students that don't incur that that challenge during school day. However, so that it's clear and there's no misinformation, I do think HIV is important. We definitely need to look at it and focus on it. We should be aware of it and we should be making sure that parents fully understand the statute and the law and uh, the difference between HIV matters and code of conduct matters. Um, I just don't want us to get too into the minutia with that because we have just such a large community and there's, a, there's you know, 9,000 more kids that have no idea about it because that's not their, that's not their story. That's not their life. So I don't, that's just my thoughts. Ms. Winters. Thanks. I just had um, one thought about communication and I, I definitely appreciate all the work your committee's doing. And I think you're on the right track with the um, the authenticity of face-to-face -face communication versus what can be done over social media or text. And I just wanted to sort of bring up that I really enjoyed during the bond referendum process, going to different PTAs and getting to have more authentic back and forth dialogue and conversation with community members. I think I often feel at board meetings like this, everybody gets up and has their three minutes, but we are not allowed to respond. And I think sometimes that inability to respond at that moment comes off as um, callousness or that we don't care or that we're not listening when that's not true. It's just simply the format that we're forced into doesn't allow for that authentic dialogue. But all of us sitting up here on the board are community members and we're parents as well. Um, and we share a lot of the same concerns and challenges that a lot of the people who come speak to us have. And I think, you know, maybe instead of thinking about, you know, things like a greater social media presence, if we can think about ways to more authentically 
engage in dialogue with people face to face and have those good back and forth conversations. It might help people understand better um, the work that we're trying to do, because I really believe that everybody on this board is here for the right reasons. And sometimes that just doesn't come across in other contexts. So that that's my only suggestion when you're thinking about communication, don't forget the old fashioned kinds of face to face. Ms. Stern. Yeah, so I just, uh, Ms. Lamar Stratton and, and Mrs. Winters, just to kind of respond to um, their, I guess, go off of what both of you are saying. Um, uh, we're, we are, we will be due Dr. Malosh in a month for another minute with, <laughs> for me to be invited to another minute. I did get to do one so far. So um, definitely we'll be happy to join in on, on any of them. Um, and so a great idea. And I think um, uh, we have been actively begging to be invited to PTA meetings as a board for the past couple months. And we were invited to one Dr. Malosh Mr. Mayor and I went, it, we spent two hours meeting with that PTA. I thought it was an extremely uh, in, uh, wonderful, you know, exchange of real conversation. Um, the feedback I've gotten again and again was that, that the, the people who were in that PTA meeting found it to be very informative and helpful. And people said that after at the end too. The zone PTA president keeps putting it out there. I, we are begging, please invite us to your PTA meetings. <laughs> please, we will come, we will show up and we will spend time and we will speak and we'll have real conversations and we'll have back and forth exchange rather than being, this is a, this is a work meeting. This is a meeting where we're spending hours and hours trying to get a lot of work done. So that's not, it's not an exchange opportunity in that way, but we want those. Um, we are also due in our goals. It's listed in our goals that we will have quarterly town hall meetings. We are in March. It is time to have a quarterly town hall meeting. We are, we, we must, and you know, we're a board of many of us, you know, some of the longest serving board members here have only been here for two or three years. So, you know, we're, we're getting our bearings here, but we got to get, we got to get that moving. So that's another way. Um, definitely have, you know, um, ways to go, but I think we're, you know, I think trying to reach people. Um, I have never felt personally such a level of misinformation as I did in the past several weeks the level of misinformation that has been perpetuated and gone to the corners of the earth I I got phone calls from people out of state I I don't even understand some of the information that has been passed around and it's startling to me Dr. Rube when you're talking about that like the 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 an, a piece of information gets put out there that is just totally inaccurate. And, and, you know, I, I think it, it's tough. We, we, we want to do our best to get accurate information, you know, correct information out there. It's hard sometimes, but I do think we have to, you know, part of it is a lot more listening. Part of it is a lot more opportunity for exchange. Um, so I'm all in on that. Anyone else? I just had one final comment, just to kind of piggyback on. So Dr. Malash said, um, I don't remember if it was at the strategic planning meeting. I think it was that like we talk in this district about HIV an, an awful lot. Um, but I, as Elmer Stratton pointed out, it's a really it's a really tiny percentage of all of the things that go on in the district. And it, it's in, you know, I think as a district, we should be proud that it is a very, very small thing. It means that a lot of the hard work in teaching, you know, kids how to get along and things is, is really working. A lot of the stuff that we're doing is working, um, you know, and, and, but then, you know, for the parent, parents and kids that are involved in that small percentage of things, I think of like what I've been told by like healthcare workers to to remember that for those parents and those kids, that's their worst day. And so I, I think that's kind of the, it's, it's a dichotomy that we have to just be comfortable with, be proud of our district, but also like remember how hard it can be for some and be, be there to um, to help build them back up. 10,000% agree, Dr. Root. I, I, I want that to be very clear that we it is the worst and 
I know that if it's something that happens that does consume your world and that is all that it's about. I just want us to not, you know, focus on it so intensely that we are missing all of the great work that's happening, all of the social emotional learning that is happening so that students can be empathetic and understanding. And there's a, you know, beyond the diversity, equity, and inclusion, there's a sense of belonging that's happening um, at many of our schools in many of our classrooms. And so I, I don't want that to be, you know, lost. So that's all. Okay, we come to the end. Close to the end, the, the voting and then closer to the end. Okay, here we go to vote. All right, we're gonna go to our action agenda. So I'm gonna ask Mrs. Winters, can you please move the curriculum and instruction ad agenda? Yes, I can. The superintendent recommends and I move the following. 17.1, approval of attendance at conference and workshops for the 22-23 school year. 17.2, Resolution authorizing submission and acceptance for, of the building capacity for career pathways and comprehensive schools. And 17.3, resolution to approve research study. Do I have a second? Ms. Fleischer, are there any questions? Ms. Sugars, can you please open the vote? Board members, you may cast your votes. Ms. Sugars, um, I need to, I, I'm not sure, so I'm going to just abstain from 17.1. Um, I think it might be a conflict, but I don't know um, that I'm, I'm teaching at one of those conferences, so I don't want to get in any trouble. But I'm yes to everything else. <laughs> Um, we have one abstention from Mr. Greenbaum. We have an ex a abstention on 17.1 from uh, Mrs. Stratton, and the rest is a yes vote. Okay, thank you. We'll move on to business and facilities. Mr. Mayor, can you please move the business and facilities agenda? I believe I can. <clears throat> um, the superintendent recommends that I move the following. 18.1, approval of bill lists. 18.2, resolution to accept the audit report. 18.3, initial submission of the 2023-2024 budget. 18.4, maximum travel expenditure. 18.5, motion to approve use of capital reserve to fund debt service. 18.6, resolution for the award of bids. And 18.7, acceptance of donations do i have a second mrs winters are there any questions mrs gallagher 18.6 i was curious the um the bond work the bids that were for the bond work like the roofing those are bond projects correct i was um i was curious how the bids fell into the estimates like what we thought the the work would cost if that makes sense um we're still within um about two hundred thousand dollars of the estimates with this work oh thank you okay are there any other questions seeing none mrs sugars would you kindly open the voting Board members, you may cast your votes. We have a unanimous yes vote. Okay. And we move on to um, human resources. Um, Ms. Stratton, could uh, Ms. Elmer Stratton, could you please move the HR agenda? Sure thing. So the superintendent recommends, and I move the following: uh, hold on, 19.1 termination of employment certificate, 19.2 termination of employment non-certificate, 
uh, 19.3 appointments certificated, 19.4 appointments non-certificated, 19.5 assignment or salary change certificated, and 19.6 assignment and salary change non-certificated. Do I have a second? Dr. Rude, any questions? Okay, thank you, Mrs. Sugars. You may cast your votes. We have a unanimous yes vote. Thank you. And okay. Lynn, I uh, just need to clarify 17.4 uh, was a mistaken vote. It should be yes. Thank you. Okay, and we move on to um, policy and legislation. Mrs. Fleischer, can you please move the P&L agenda? Thank you. The superintendent recommends and I um, move the following, 20.1 approval of harassment, intimidation, bullying, investigation decisions. Do I have a second? Mr. Greenbaum, um, any questions? Then Mrs. Sugars, can you please open the voting? Thank you. Okay, the voting is open. Ms. Sugars, I'm going to abstain um, just because I'm not sure that I heard all of those. I was present for all of those. Okay, you because it's a one item, you can just abstain. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> 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 I'm sorry. <laughs> well, then the exception noted. <laughs> We'd all like to be there. <laughs> I mean, unanimous yes vote, except for. Mrs. Stratton's abstention. All right. <laughs> All right, let's move this along. Thank you. Is there any new business? Please say no. Okay, good. Excellent. Is there any old business? Please say no. Okay, I'm sorry. To be fair to board members, truthfully, is there any? Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, I skipped over you, Dr. Reed, because there was nothing on, to vote on. So, But that's, that's coming to an end. Uh, soon we'll have something to vote on. Okay. Okay, we are now at second public comment. This is the sec. Uh, this is a time when you may comment on um, other topics. If you would like to speak now, please clearly state your name and your municipality. We will alternate between speakers in the room and those who are online. Each speaker will be given a maximum of three minutes to speak. The timer on the screen will indicate the amount of time you have remaining. Public comment is an opportunity for members of the community to comment on matters relevant to the operations of Cherry Hill Public School District or within the authority of the Cherry Hill Board of Education. The board welcomes diverse op opinions on relevant matters. Under established federal law governing reasonable restrictions on speech in public forums, statements which demean individual community members or groups, or which are irrelevant to the operations of the school district or repetitious will not be permitted. Community members who would like to present information not relevant to the school district are always welcome to communicate directly to the district superintendent board president and all board members via email or other alternative means. Okay, so um, we will start with in the room. And um, if someone would like to speak, please approach the podium and then we will alternate online. Um, Rick Short, Cherry Hill. I'm uh, very disappointed tonight in this uh, this budget. This $242 million budget. Um, Dr. Malash, your mission, one of the most important things you talk about all the time, and that is the safety and security of our children. Uh, Madam President, you're also missing the safety and security of our children. These cameras at not at the stadium aren't there just for football games. They're there for 24 hours a day security. And this board has failed. What will, what would be the cost? 
let's say $3,000 a camera times eight, $24,000, throw another $24,000 in to install them. It's around $50,000, but I could be wrong. It could be $70,000. I'm not an electrician, but I'm in the ballpark between 50 and $70,000. And you're telling me after eight shots were fired in October of 20, 2020 that we can't find 50 or $70,000 to make our track safe 24 hours a day. It's really sad that you can't be that creative and you're not putting the safety of our uh, community first. Um, and I move on to my second question, which never seems to get answered. I have two slides here. One is from the bond for paving Lewis and one is from capital reserves, $600,000. This is what you told the public. This is what you approved. This was in the bond. It is what it is, but nobody will answer it. It's not misinformation. You can't answer it. You can't admit you made a mistake. That's my opinion, right? Let's move on to a, a speech given by one of our students. Um, it was an award on um, December 20th, 2022. It was a real great story. Hannah, part of the West tennis team, amazing story. Um, but at the end, and she was well-deserved. She got a standing ovation. Um, on A23, Dr. Malash uh, mentioned in a uh, comments after uh, public comments that there's no, um, no altercations of the uh, videos, nothing, not, nothing, ever, nothing ever done to the videos. So what's going on, folks? I sent you the email today. Maybe you haven't reviewed it. But I'll be back again asking the same question. But I hope you find seventy or fifty thousand dollars to make our schools safer. And you do have two hundred thousand dollars already from the bond left over. And I hope you make the right choice. Okay, and we go to the line. Um, and it's uh eight five six four eight nine. That person, if you could please state your name and your municipality. My name is Jeff Potowitz, and I live in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. Um, an article in the Asbury Park dated July 16th, 2019, contained a comparison of school property taxes for the average valued home in New Jersey. And that home is, was, was worth $323,179. In Haddonfield, the tax on that house, school tax, would be $5,000, approximately $5,300. In Voorhees, the school tax would be approximately $6,100. And in Cherry Hill, the school tax would be $6,500. I hope that answers the board questions. They're higher in the taxes. We're higher in Cherry Hill. That $363 million in, bond, in, in borrowing for the bond represented our legal debt limit. We could not borrow any more money. Remember, only $300 million of that was sold. $4 million or less was, is going to be transferred from capital reserve funds and put towards paying for the bond. Sooner or later, that transfer of funds will stop, especially when and if our leaderships apply for ROD grants or other state grants that will be used towards preschool construction or other, or other renovation projects having to do with preschool. In Camden City, the cost to the state for universal preschool is approximately $31 million. That's approximately $31,000 per student. We know what the cost of preschool is, of universal preschool, in a large district. That's what it is, $31,000 a student. For Cherry Hill, the cost of construction, renovations, construction, and 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 concerning preschools would not be in addition to that 31 million. Eventually the preschool, okay, will have an estimated 1700 students for a cost based on what Camden city costs and the state pays for that 
of fi- approximately $52 million extra a year. Of that $52 million, I don't know how much we're going to get for the state, but not even close to the $31 million plus. It's going to cost us. The state thinks $12,000 per pupil is too cheap. It's too much. They want to go less. Oh, and recall, uh, the state doesn't give you any extra funds for the kids who have IEPs and and 504s that are in preschool. They don't count to the state of New Jersey. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of money to pay. All right? And by the way, the state state will be glad to have you join this. All right? Because we are. Um, We have to stop. I'm sorry. You're out of time. Okay, thank you. We'll go back to the room. If there's anyone who'd like to speak at the podium. Uh, Yoni Yarish, Cherry Hill, I'll try to go quick. It is a very late hour, so I want to get appreciation for all your work that you do. I um, appreciate the idea of the board going out. Um, as someone who's been very working towards supporting communities underserved and who've been typically marginalized, PTA is a wonderful outlet, but we also need to make sure that we're going out. As a membership organization, it does not necessarily get a representative population of the district. Um, so I think we did a great job last year working out with special education parents, this week working with the Hispanic families, is to keep making sure that our outreach doesn't just exist to the quote unquote normative groups, but that we also go out um, and really reach out. We have got Chaka, for example, that always comes to mind. There's a new Turkish community center that we're really working sure that we're going out and outreaching and meeting people where they're at, not always requiring them to come into the building. There is trauma that many families have. Uh, looking at research who had horrible educational experiences. They will not set foot back in a school due to how challenging their experiences were, but their voices need to be heard because their children could be experiencing the trauma that they uh, went through. Um, to make sure that we figure out ways to meet them. Technology has been helpful for that, but when we're having this conversation, the communication is to make sure that we're open and inclusive in that process. We're not going to be able to hit everyone. It's impossible. But to really go out and do as much as we can, to pivot to a fun item, um, as I always like to do, um, with Mr. Kovnett being honored for 25 years, his daughter, who is a Charlie East alum, now has up in Terminal C and D in Philly International Airport a massive art display. Um, so product of what our art education does in Cherry Hill, our alumni are getting things out in the public like that. So that's awesome and huge. And I'm going to leave it at that because it's really late. Okay. We go back to the line. And it is the phone number that's 856 220. Please unmute yourself. It's your, it's your name and municipality. Okay, um, looks like the hand went down. So I'll go to the next hand that's up online, which is um, Sarah uh, Jocelyn. If you could um, just state your name and municipality. Thank you. Sarah Jocelyn, uh, Cherry Hill. Well, I thank you for uh, this discussion about the uh, preschool. And I also want to uh, you know, uh, make sure that there is uh, an understanding of the number of children that would be involved. I understand your current plan includes the ability to go f- to full day school in, uh, for the current preschool. I think there's about 150 children in this right now. But the number that would be um, involved with uh, a universal pre-K will be much larger than that. And I do think there needs to be consideration of, of how you're going to either partner or uh, provide space for these children. Um, It was mentioned earlier in the meeting about being one of the early leaders in this. I would remind the board that Voorhees has already started in this area, and I would think that they have about a comparable number of students, maybe not the same number, but a good sampling. Their target is to have have pre-K available for up to 500 children by the end of their five-year period. So... uh, I I encourage you to be aware of what Voorhees is doing in other districts because this is not, we are not the first district. Um, I do support pre-K. I do think, uh, I remember when we had to add four um, new kindergarten rooms on the back of Russell Knight. So I, I fully expect that there will be additional construction required. And I remind the board of the, of that issue Um, as others have done. I earlier came to talk about the issue of summer reading, and I I do want to say that's an important thing. Um, 
I was surprised to see that undefeated Jim Thorpe uh, and, the, and the Carlisle Indian School football team was removed. I think this is a book that is certainly accessible for a certain population. Um, I think it is a, a very qualified book. Um, and I would like to see if, the, if there would be a, a possibility of continuing to have that on the reading list. Uh, books that are of interest to other children, uh, to the wide breadth of children in the school are very important. And I agree with the, um, the representative who spoke about uh, the short shrift given to the, to the reading. Um, I would suggest that you might consider one of the swashbuckling uh, stories like Scaramouche, Scarlet Pimpernel, something that's a little bit on the other end. Um, I know that when I was in the eighth grade, we read the, uh, I was one of the ones that read the, um, over, the Bridges Over Tokeri. So reading is very individual and choice. You need to give a wide breadth. Thank you. Okay, let me go back to the room. Does anybody like to speak at the podium? Okay, we'll go back online and we have Anne uh, Jirasi, I believe it is. Uh, you could state your name and municipality, please. Uh, Anne Jirasi, please uh, unmute. Thank you. Um, it's late. Happy Pi Day uh, for what's left of it. I appreciate all the hard work you did to put together a budget. I just had a couple of questions. I saw that the district plans to hire the three additional math coaches for the fall. And I was hoping that there will be one math coach allocated to each elementary school with the below average math scores, somebody that can be there um, more than just a pop in every now and again, um, somebody that's there more full time. Uh, second comment was about the educational assistant allotments comment that was made last we are last meeting at Bret Hart about Bret Hart having two per grade level. Uh, right now, the district has 25 openings for educational assistance. I understand um, some are allocated as one to one for some students who need them. Um, my question is why Kingston is not staffed at at least one educational assistant per grade. The published student uh, teacher ratio says it's 11 to one, but that number seems to be completely out of date or really um, not reflective of the majority of the classes. Um, my child loves to tell me about his day in detail. He's in one class with 22 kids for most of the day. Um, I've heard that there are three grade levels on the playground and only two to three educational assistants sometimes. Um, I've heard that the gym teacher and the educational assistant were absent on the same day and they had one sub and over 40 kids taking gym. Um, there was another day where they had no gym teacher, no educational assistant, and his classroom teacher filled in for gym. Um, and I was just trying to put together that that's like a ratio multiple times of one teacher to a large population of students. I saw that this district is planning to expand preschool and you would need 10 additional educational assistants for that. Um, I realize the money is there and I see the appeal for the full day preschool, but my concern is that you'd be taking hires away that should be sent to the elementary schools. The elementary schools are really struggling with kids that need extra academic support and the educational students really provide that. Um, so that is really my main concern is that staffing wise, you would be spreading the elementary schools too thin. Uh, that's all I have, but thank you and have a good night. Okay, and we go back to the room. Just state your name and municipality, please. Alana Yaris, Cherry Hill. Um, I thought that the budget presentation was very well done. Everything explained well. I noticed that um, there were increases everywhere. There was one decrease of $536,000 in administrative costs. I was just wondering when we spoke about all of the increases in the budget for next year, what is it that the district is losing in that negative balance that was showing? Thank you. Okay, let me go back to the line. And Carolina Bevett, you are up. Name and municipality, please. 
Carolina Bevid, Cherry Hill. Um, I think pre-K would be a really great topic for a town hall. Um, if not, then maybe a community survey would be a good idea. Um, I read an article this week linking depression and anxiety, specifically in teenage girls, to certain types of thinking, such as catastrophizing and emotional reasoning. And um, according to the article, thinking in these ways can be symptoms or causes of depression, and breaking out of them can be a cure. So based on this information, I'd like our board and administrators to please be vigilant that our curriculum is not contributing to negative mental impacts. Catastrophic language like climate crisis or a hyper focus on problematic language can all contribute to feelings of depression and anxiety. Not to say that our curriculum should only focus on the positive, but I hope we're ensuring that there is a balance and kids are not being taught uh, and kids are being taught to have hope and that the future of the world doesn't solely rest on their shoulders. The article also points to research that teaching students to have an internal locus of control where they feel as if they have the power to choose a course of action and make it happen versus an external locus of control where they have little sense of agency and become that, um, they believe that strong forces or agents outside of themselves will determine what happens to them produces happier people. So I'd love to see um, kids being taught how to have an internal locus of control in our schools. Thanks. Okay, let me go back to the room. And there's nobody at the podium, so we go back online. And uh, Nicole Nance, if you could please state your name and your municipality. Yes, good evening, Nicole Nance, Cherry Hill. Um, throughout the discussion tonight, we discussed a lot. Thank you for uh, that budget presentation. It did help with some things for me. I have four questions, four points, and you can answer them in your closing comments or even send me an email. You mentioned something about choice books. I'm not sure I understand what that is. Um, I think Mrs. Fleischer mentioned something about policy and legislation 5770, modifying of language as it has to do with parents. Could you expound on that just a little bit? I heard something about virtual clearing in the home and then also S12. So those are the four points if someone could just elaborate just a little bit more on, and because of the late hour, if you don't do it tonight, I understand, but I can certainly um, reach out and get a, an email response. Thank you. Okay, we go back to the room. And no one's at the podium, so we go back online. And we have uh, Jennifer, if you could please state your full name and your municipality. Hi, Jennifer Sharman, and I'm a Cherry Hill resident. Um, thank you guys for all your time. Um, I know this is the long, long night, so I will try to be quick. Um, just a couple things. Um, one, I would like to welcome our new member that I've seen there, um, uh, Kim Gallagher, and thank you for all your great questions. I know you um, joked a little bit about how many questions you had, but I really appreciate them because they help us give it more insight. Um, secondly, I have some questions regarding um, the S-12 procedure that you had mentioned. Um, I'd like to also have some follow-up regarding um, this these new procedure updates and also regarding the um, I guess transitional coaches, you know, the um, and the insight program that you are um, implementing, because um, I understand the safety of the students is a great concern and, um, you know, we want to help our students. Um, however, we also uh, schools are not supposed to be directing care um, and forcing a child to get psychiatric evaluations is, you know, in order to return to school is forcing care. Um, and by not allowing them to return to school is kind of blackmail. So um, I do understand that the New Jersey state is trying to implement different um, behavioral health uh, policies um, to help different students with different um, issues or, or problematic behaviors. Um, but there's no law at this time that I had found. And um, Cherry Hill uh, can also, you know, interpret these types of um, regulations or not regulations, but maybe I guess um, suggestions um, or ideas that the state wants to have. And I'm just hoping that you're going to um, err on the side of caution with 
forcing children to get psychiatric evaluations because you don't want to become helicopter schools. You don't want to have school overreach. Um, but at the same time, you do want to be able to help parents help their kids, but not by directing care. Thank you. Um, that's all I have to say. Okay, we go back to the room. And there's nobody at the podium. So we go back online. And it's Amanda Greenstein. Um, you can please say your name and municipality. Hi, Amanda Greenstein, Cherry Hill, New Jersey. Um, I just wanted to speak about, I appreciate um, Kim Gallagher asking the questions about the full day kindergarten, or excuse me, pre-K, and what would be um, taken away from the K to 12 education. Um, uh, as Ms. Androsi had said, we are severely lacking educational assistance at the elementary level in the school district. Um, Educational assistance, we had a teacher at Kingston, kindergarten teacher out as a long-term sub, and on days when they couldn't get a sub to cover her classroom, um, it was an inclusion class, there was an EA in there with the special ed teacher. Um, we need to fix the problems that are going on in the elementary schools, in the middle schools, and in the high schools before we take on an undertaking of trying to create a full day pre-K. Um, to Speaking to that also, as a kindergarten parent and having a fourth grader that went private school for pre-K and kindergarten, and then had a seamless transition into first grade. I think that the curriculum and instruction committee needs to take up, and the super, the assistant superintendents that handle curriculum need to take up the, the children coming in from the Barclay school are woefully unprepared for the curriculum that Cherry Hill offers at the kindergarten level. Um, you are going from a very play-based education at Barclay to a very, education based education and books and sheet and writing and um, worksheets and the kids are not prepared for it so maybe the first line of your thinking should be maybe our curriculum at Barclays should prepare the kids for kindergarten um, the educational assistants the teachers we are the ones the, as the parents that are in and out of these schools and are talking to our children and are talking to our teachers and these teachers and these ed assistants need help and they need resources and that you guys need to figure out what you're going to do to support them so that they're successful in teaching our children. Um, and my last point is to board member Stratton. Um, you might only see it as 1,000 out of 10,000 kids being affected by a HIB and 9,000 not being affected. But like Dr. Rude said, that's those families that are going through that are that is all that is going on in their world. And for you to discount that because it's not in the majority is woefully ignorant of you. And for you to say that you don't want it to diminish the good that's going on, you should really take a back seat and put your, yourself in the shoes of those family members. Thank you. Okay, I'm back into the room to the podium. And then we go back online and there's a hand online and that is uh, Dave K, if you could please state your full name, uh, first name and last name, and your municipality. Dave Kuzmanich, Cherry Hill. Um, i like to say thank you for hearing my son out this evening. Even though it took a long time to get to the first public comment, we were about to leave, so he could go home, go to bed. Um, the one thing I wanted to point out is a young lady uh, on the board there earlier this evening, probably about an hour and a half ago, talked about how you guys are not allowed to interact during public comment or, uh, yeah, to interact. Um, but I would suggest that when a student is speaking that everyone pay attention because I rewatched the video on my wife's phone and my phone. There were a lot of, a lot of members there typing away at their keyboards. I know, you know, and we as adults can multitask, but to a 12 year old, especially one who, who is holding up a HIB report that says nothing, no evidence found. And then adults are not paying attention to, to, to this 12 year old that had enough gumption to stand up in front of 15, 20 adults. That really did not help his, his demeanor for the rest of the evening. You know, this, did, this boy did a brave thing tonight that I wish other students would come up and do is talk in front of the board about their experiences. 
because yes, some of you parent, some of you have are parents and have kids in the system here. Not all of you are going through Hibs, obviously, because you're, you know, your kids probably aren't getting bullied. Um, but there are a lot of us out there that, that, that are going through the hip system and a lot of kids are being bullied, whether it's on the bus, the playground, in the hallways, in the classroom, you know, for my son to be asked if he's a lesbian, you know, I'm sure there is many more students out there that are not coming forward. I think what we need to do is just pay attention because you guys talk about student voice all the time. When that student voice is at the podium, I think we all need to stop typing at the keyboards and pay attention. And I understand about the comment being made about not saying the other students' names, but there is no last name spoken during that presentation. So nobody would really know who he was talking about. Thank you. Okay, uh, go back to the room and no one at the podium. So going, going to close public comment. And now we move on to superintendent's comments. Thank you, Ms. Stern. Uh, I appreciate, I'll just go through quickly. Um, Mr. Kuzmanich, thank you to Aiden for his getting up and speaking this evening. I can tell you because I spend a lot of time with the board members, um, as the board members are typing, um, they're taking notes uh, that they refer back to in terms of, of what goes on. Uh, I do believe that helps them uh, with their focus in, in terms of what's taking place so they can attend um, you know, to, uh, to what's there. Um, Ms. Sharman, if you, if you send us an email with your specific questions um, about S12, about coaches, transitional coaches, insight, uh, we can certainly follow up. You can send that to, to me. You can send it. I know that you've been corresponding with Dr. Morton. You can send it to Dr. Morton. He'll get the questions where they need to go. Um, Ms. Nance, uh, same thing. Um, if you have questions, you know, you can certainly send those. I'm not sure what to address uh, in what you listed. Um, Ms. Yaris, the decrease in administrative costs um, it comes in various areas, uh, professional fees, technology, um, things like that. Uh, there's no decrease uh, in staff uh, or in actual staff. Um, Ms. Jocelyn, the, um, the book, uh, it, it's not been removed as an approved book. It's just no longer um, on, the, on the choice list for during the summer, the Jim Thorpe book. Uh, and I believe when uh, the curriculum staff presented at the CNI meeting, that in the, in the few years that that's been a choice book, it's only been selected by two students um, in that time. Um, so uh, we do, I, I think it's a great book. Uh, the, the story of Jim Thorpe, who he was and what he did and, and what he means to our country, I think is, is very important. Um, but we wanted a book, we, we are selecting new books to try and broaden uh, what children have the opportunity to choose from. Um, Voorhees, in terms of the kindergarten, you know, the, the folks that are preschool, the folks that have worked on the, the preschool uh, have spoken with many of our neighboring districts and, and honestly districts across South Jersey. Uh, Voorhees is working on theirs moving forward. They're dramatically smaller than we are uh, in terms of numbers. Um, Mr. Short um, asked a question about the, the work uh, being done in the Lewis parking lot. There is work that's budgeted in the referendum to be done uh, here. And there is work that, that's also budgeted that's not in the referendum to be done here in terms of site work. Um, all the projects, you know, as, as uh, projects were selected to be done, um, both in the bond and capital reserve, um, you know, we'll help, hopefully we'll be able to get everything that needs to be done in the parking lot uh, to be done. Capital reserve work only addresses part of the work and the bond work addresses the rest of it. Uh, like many of the things, projects are broken up from one spot to the other. Um, it's not, you know, and, and I know you shared that that was your opinion. So that's the fact about what it is. If you have additional questions, you can certainly let us know. Let me also clarify for folks, because Mr. Short has said this a couple of times about a football game uh, and gunshots. There were no gunshots at a football game at the stadium at High School West. That didn't, nothing at a football game. Was there an issue that went on in the community? Yes. Football game continued. Police were there. The district staff were there. Nothing inside the stadium, nothing that took place at a football game. Football game continued. The marching band played. The folks were there. Fans were there. 
Um, there was something that was going on in the community. No matter how many, how many cameras may be put up inside the stadium, that's not going to control what goes on in the community, nor is it going to capture what goes on in the community that's around the stadium. I think going back even to first, I think that might be it. Miss uh, Miss Stern. Thank you. Okay. I mean, we could stay another 20 minutes, 23 minutes. Well, we we do have a second exec. So we will stay, but we could keep the meeting going. Or I could entertain a motion to Aiden is going to <laughs> a motion to go into um executive session to review student. To review student matters, do I have a, no action will be taken. Do I have a second? Finally, I got it right. Mr. Greenbaum, uh, all in favor, motion carries. Thank you. Come on, Aiden, come on, Liz.